Accounts from a Lonely Broadcast Station. Dead Air. From up here, you can see everything. Rows and rows of rich evergreens, hazy mountain peaks, a wide blue sky. You can see the sleepy little village of Pine Haven, the town where I was born, and miles upon miles of empty road leading to somewhere. Sometimes, if you're really lucky, you can see the most glorious golden sunrise ascending over the mountaintop as if the whole world was on fire. I was having one of those lucky mornings as I stood by the lookout window, here in the repurposed fire watchtower that had become the center of operations for 104.6 FM. The radio station that shouldn't exist. My name is Evelyn. I've told my story before. Twice, in fact. And that was a long time ago. <laughs> but don't worry. I'll catch up to speed. Yes, Pine Haven Radio is still on the air. The fog still rolls in from time to time, as it always has. And every day is still a gamble between boredom, terror, and batshit stupidity. And sometimes the clocks run backwards, you know, stuff like that. Yesterday, the staircase gained about mm, 17 extra steps, but only for like an hour, you know. And there's still a bird with human eyes named Bartholomew who sits by the fire escape. He leaves weird little presents outside all the time just to mess with me, you know? Piles of earthworms, bottle caps, the occasional collection of sun-bleached human teeth. You know, we, we don't know where he gets the teeth. We've been feeling earthquakes lately. Now and again, I see a pale, rotten figure floating upside down at the tree line. But it only shows up on the security cameras. He's shy, I suppose. The Amalgamite, still out there. Well, official sources call it the Amalgamite. We just call him Big Boy. Because it's hard to be scared of something called Big Boy. Even if it is an enormous man-eating flesh giant, cobbled together from various human and animal parts. You know, he's a real piece of shit, too. He's added a few more body parts since my last update. The greedy bastard. Thankfully, he still only has one of mine. And sometimes, late at night, when I'm listening to the radio, after uh, Dan has gone home, of course, I see a bright magenta glow coming from deep in the woods. It pulsates a little bit and carries a strange hum on the evening wind. But then it goes away before the sun rises. I don't know what it is or where it came from, but I'm not going out there to check it out. But, you know, not everything's been bad. Their buddy Finn got a promotion, you know? He's a fancy forest ranger now. Like a super cool uniform. And everything, really, but he still hangs out here part-time as our official survival expert. I still don't know his first name, and we're kind of starting to theorize that he, like, doesn't have one, but rather he was just born one day, fully formed with a beard and a gym membership. <laughs> I finally got myself a set of wheels. It's an old red pickup truck. Daniel turned 33 this year, and Finn and I baked a cake for him, which turned out surprisingly, uh, like, edible, you know, even if it kind of did have the texture of cat food. I bought him a vintage Polaroid camera that he'd been eyeing and like some novelty pattern bow ties, which he has been wearing daily ever since. When we have time, he's been helping me brush up on my sign language, which, you know, it's going pretty well-ish. Well, well and, my, and my Spanish, which is going terribly. We're thinking of decorating the radio station for Christmas soon. 
You might wonder why we even bother to breathe life into this place, but the answer is very simple. Even a little corner of hell can be a home if you're stubborn enough. I was watching one of the security cameras glaring over a coffee cup. All night, I had been seeing this, like, hunched-over creature, vaguely dog-shaped, staggering back and forth by the tree line as if it was, like, trying to cross the boundary. God, it had been at it for hours. I was still there. Only now it was staring directly at the camera lens, just far enough away that I, you know, could make out its face. I think it knew I was watching. I was about to try throwing a stick into the woods to see if it'd, like, you know, chase it and leave, but it ran off when it heard a car pull up in the long gravel driveway. A few minutes later, the door swung open. A gust of cold air came blowing in as my now full-time co-host, Daniel Esperanza, stood there, rubbing his frozen hands together like a cricket that made a wish to be turned into a man. I had big plans today, and he was going to be joining me. It's moving day, my good bitch! I exclaimed joyously after chugging an entire cup of coffee in one go. Dan raised his arms up in triumph, whooping excitedly, and then reaching out to give me a high five. I tried to slap his hand, but I missed completely. Good morning to you, too. He laughed at my pathetic display. So, you little vampire bat, you excited to move out of the storage closet at long last? I threw my head back with an exasperated sound. Oh my god, you have no idea, I told him, already getting my coat on. I had packed already, so prepared to go out of the dusty cave and move into a slightly bigger cave with windows. <sighs> I'm gonna miss the smell of mold and the spiders, though. Made for a good midnight snack. Daniel snickered as I snapped my teeth with a loud click. He was fishing his keys out of his pocket. Oh, you'll still get plenty of that, don't you worry. Come on, let's bust out of this joint. As we left the broadcast station on a cold winter morning, filling the back of Dan's station wagon, Finn was already pulling up to take over my shift. He gave us a sleepy wave as our vehicles passed like two ships in the night. On the way to the apartment building, I felt... good. <laughs> I felt like things were finally working out for me after all this time. Shocking, I know. So, the landlord kind of sucks, Dan explained on the way. Never shows up on time when something breaks, and he tries to do a lot of repairs on his own, but, like, he's bad at it, so if the ceiling springs a leak, make sure you have buckets on hand. Oh, um, I live on the second floor, so, like, if you ever need Dan, buddy, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I interrupted him with a laugh. I, I know, I know, you've been through it all before. I'll be... Okay. Really? Daniel was grinning as he turned the corner, all while snow flurries melted against the windshield. He spared me the quickest glance of friendly brown eyes, so dark they were almost black, before watching the road again. Sorry, I know, I, I'm just proud of you, Lynn. You come a long way, and I really want this to work out. <laughs> Me too, amigo. For the first time in my whole life, I finally did feel proud. <laughs> I mean, I, I finally had a real place of my own. I'm sure the plumbing sucks, and I'm pretty sure I heard a rumor that like the last tenants were busted for selling cocaine or something, but oh, you know, it's okay. It's mine. It's home. It's better than my last residence. Hey, Danny boy, um, how is it, uh, we're gonna get the couch up to the fifth floor? He made a popping sound with his lips and then sighed, long and displeased. I hadn't thought about that. 
What do you do when you get that feeling that you've already lived this day before? You know what it's like. Starts with one familiar word or a smell or sight, and suddenly you're back in the place you forgot about. You're back in a place that used to be special. It was the strain on my muscles as I carried a cardboard box up a set of stairs, filled just a little too heavy. It was the jingle of a new set of keys and the embarrassing struggle of trying to open a sticking door for the first time. It was the familiar face of a friend being just as incompetent as I was. Okay, go a little more left. No, left, left, Danny, left. Your left and mine are not the same. Daniel and I were trying and failing to get a sofa through the door. We ended up having to put it down and rethink our approach. Oh, well, this cumbersome piece of furniture sat diagonally in a hallway under a flickering, dirty yellow light. We're a comedy of errors, you and I, Daniel said as he stretched a long leg over the arm of the couch and climbed over, deciding to plop down. He sank into the cushions, half disappearing as his whole body turned into a big, limp noodle. It's comfortable, at least. Where'd you get it? From the dump? <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I, like, scraped some of the mold off. Not the fleas, though. Fleas can totally stay. I let myself fall onto the couch, head against the cushion and my legs dangling over the arm. Daniel only briefly wrinkled his nose. He'd stopped being bothered by my jokes a real long time ago, learning to keep up with my annoying bullfuckery. That's no issue. You've always had fleas. He flashed a big, stupid grin and poked me square in the forehead. Thrift store? Yeah, yeah, it was a thrift store. Side by side on a sofa too big to fit through the door, we looked like, well, <laughs> we looked like a couple of dipshits. And there it was again, that feeling that I'd been here before. I could smell the fresh paint in my memory. I could hear the struggle and the laughter on the day Jennifer moved me into her apartment. Sometimes, when those thoughts were this vivid, I forgot that she'd been gone for a long, long time. <laughs> God, I miss her. It's winter now. The green of summer had turned brown and the warm, humid air was choked by the bitter cold of the mountain. Another season gone. No, not gone. Survived. Jesus, how long had it been? Three years? Four? <laughs> now, as another year came to an end, Daniel, Finn, and I could say what was once thought to be impossible. We had lasted longer than anyone else. It only took 27 former radio DJs for a couple to finally stick. I guess. Hmm. It was another hour of struggling, lifting, and arguing, but the deed was finally done. My new place didn't look like much, nor did it really smell the greatest, but compared to a storage closet on the underset of a yellow park slide, it was fantastic. After taking a few pictures of me with the Polaroid, despite my protests, Dan parked himself back down on the couch. He was waving one of the photos around while it developed. It was a nice shot of me flipping off the camera while slumped over the back of the sofa. Exhausted. Oh God, you want some water? I asked after I had time to catch my breath. Do you have ice? Dan stretched down on the sofa, feet hanging off the edge. There was a hint of a shit-eating smirk on his face. Nope, nope, sorry. It all melted in the moving box. Jackass. I was grabbing a mug out of storage. You stand outside long enough, though. Hey, yeah, and maybe you'll catch some snowflakes in your cup. I made the tiny trip over to the kitchenette on legs that felt like two sticks of melting butter. I turned the sink handle, but nothing came out. It simply made a weak gurgle of sound and dripped the tiniest 
tiniest bit of brown liquid from the spout. It wasn't until I decided to give the faucet a nice smack that it actually worked. It rumbled, and I watched an uneven spray of gritty, red-brown water start to burst from the pipe, leaving sediment and bits of rust in the basin below. The smell was bitter, and it turned my stomach. I was eager to turn it off. This was another one of those familiar memories when my logical brain knew that it was only rust. But my memory brought back a feeling so powerful and so clear that I could feel the stickiness of fresh blood on my fingertips. I recalled the taste, the texture, and the way the kitchen sink bubbled. It wasn't the same, I told myself. This was not the broadcast room where blood ran from the faucets and ghosts cried in the pipes every day, but why did it feel like I was still there, like, like I would always be there? Uh, water's bad? I wiped my hands on my jeans and turned to lean against the counter. I'll go to the store. You know, get a couple of gallons, call the landlord in the morning or something. It's probably just rusted pipes. Hey, I'll be back in a few minutes, though. Just lock the door if you leave. Okay? Dan gave me a tired thumbs up, seemingly in no rush to go anywhere just yet. Walking into the shops felt like doing it for the first time, as if my mother had given me a $10 bill and sent me on, like, this nerve-wracking mission for toilet paper. I really wasn't used to having access to the outside world. The lights were so harsh, the sounds overwhelming. (laughs) I couldn't remember the last time I'd been in public like this. We'll leave these outside tonight for Toby, okay? (laughs) Yeah, he'll, he'll come back. A woman's voice caught my attention, and the rattle of a plastic container of dog treats from the other side of the aisle. A small child sniffled. What if Toby don't want to come out of the woods? What if he likes it better? The woman shushed her child, and I heard the squeak of the grocery cart's wheels as she began to turn it around. He knows where his home is, baby. I put a bottle of dish soap in my basket without looking. Sometimes it hurts, knowing more than the people here in town. Other times I envied the innocence of not knowing what happened to those we lost to the forest. Those who would never be the same. (laughs) And again, I think some of them knew. It was just easier and safer to bury your head in the sand. I felt dizzy, walking from aisle to aisle. Sometimes I forgot which direction I was going in and I saw the same things happening again and again up and down the same few steps. I was seeing colors and shapes of items on the shelves, but I I couldn't tell what they were anymore. I I couldn't even remember how to make myself recognize them. That swirling cloud of confusion fogged my brain and made it hard to breathe. And for no reason. Everything was just so overwhelming, so loud and bright. The anxiety's been getting steadily worse each year, I think. Goosebumps rose on my arms as the cold from the refrigerators hit my skin. I could hear the blunt chop of a knife against wood as I passed by the deli, one sheet of glass between me and the slabs of meat on display. I could smell the blood subtle and lingering with the numb scent of cold refrigeration. I heard a wheeze from below. It was coming from a fish head, freshly chopped from the body, but still moving, still gasping for water. Its dead, cold eyes stared directly at me, human and pleading for some kind of release from its pain. My spine began to tingle when I realized it was trying to form words. 
and that it had a mouthful of teeth that certainly didn't belong to it. I heard another loud chop from behind the counter and looked up to see the butcher's gray, lifeless face. He was smiling impossibly wide, with eyes that were just two huge orbs stuck into his head. The eyes of a dead fish. They blinked one at a time with a wet, sticky sound. He brought down his knife again, a splatter of blood hitting his apron as he sliced into some unknown slab of fresh, moving, breathing tissue. All at once, everything in the display was alive and wriggling. Screaming. Something cold and wet touched my shoulder. I jumped, a hoarse whimper leaving my throat the moment I heard a voice behind my back. It was the dry, painful croak of something long, dead, that rattled in my ear. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see an open mouth, still filled with twigs, leaves, and the smell of woodland decay. Her jaw unhinged with a series of cracks, and that dry voice spoke again, her whispers morphing into something that almost began to sound like my name. I didn't want to look. I couldn't look. The quick, building dread in my heart didn't want to recognize the face again. I never wanted to see her again. I squeezed my eyes shut, every muscle in my body tensing, and my fists balled up so forcefully and so tight that I could feel my fingernails cutting into the skin of my palms. If it hurt, maybe it could wake me. Maybe it could end this dream. <laughs> Do you miss me? Her voice was like gravel. Like sawdust in an old, withered, dead throat. Do you miss me? Do you miss... Do you miss... Miss? The hand on my shoulder was warm and soft, and all at once, the sounds of the grocery store flooded into my ears, and the bright light hit my eye with a sudden, migraine-inducing force. Calm music was playing overhead. I blinked. I was looking at the deli again. The man behind the counter had stopped what he was doing and was watching me, concerned. Everything in the display was... normal. Miss, can you hear me? Is everything alright? My heart pounded as I turned my head, where I expected to see a decayed and withered corpse. I saw the kind face of a lady in a green smock. How long has she been standing there? How long had I been standing there? I'm... I'm fine. My tongue was dry as I spoke. I wasn't fine. Not this time. The fact was that I, I couldn't leave the station without bringing it with me, no matter where I went. That tower and I... Oh, we would always be bound together in this terrible, toxic relationship where everything I saw reminded me of that place. It was in my thoughts as I checked out at the front of the store, the people in line behind me whispering to one another. It was there, floating around in my head as I looked up at the overcast sky and stepped into the cold air. And it was still in my thoughts as I headed home, both arms sore from the weight of the grocery bags filled with water, snacks, and a bottle of tequila. I don't know how it got in my car. A cold, eerie wind blew through my hair. A dead leaf rolled across the sidewalk in front of me, and I could hear the pines shiver in the breeze. I stopped turning my head to look into the woods. There was no escaping it, was there? 
I recalled the night I lost my eye. The night we found Jennifer's corpse in the tree. The night of the graduation party, where I saw... <sighs> Never mind. From between the trees, I could hear heavy, labored breathing. It was a wet sound, like lungs full of water, but unable to cough. I put down my grocery bags and stepped forward, the snow crunching underneath my feet as I left the safety of the sidewalk, just to get a closer look. I could see something, hunched, just beyond the tree line, half hidden in the pines. It had light-colored fur with reddened patches of disease, facing away from me on all fours and vomiting some kind of a dark, tarry liquid onto the snow. The sound of its retching reminded me of an old man, making me all the more happy that I couldn't see its face. I don't think it had a dog's face anymore. Toby! I heard a little voice. Mom, look, it's Toby! It was that same young boy who was in the grocery store, pulling on his mother's hand and pointing at the creature from the sidewalk. The beast bristled and ran off, its gait made clumsy by the fact that its feet seemed to be pointing in the wrong direction. I heard the jingle of a dog collar as it went. No, 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 honey, the boy's mother whispered. That, that's not Toby. No, no, come on, we have to get home. I, I don't want you going over there, okay? The woman and I made eye contact for a brief moment. But she looked away and quickened her pace, pushing the child along. As they hurried down the path, I could hear the little boy asking quietly, Who was that lady? What happened to her eye? His mother didn't answer. The beast from the woods was gone now, slipping deep into the pines. It left behind backwards footprints and a bubbling pile of hot, black acid that was currently sinking into the ground and melting the snow around it. Note to self... If you find more traces of forbidden goo in the woods, don't touch it, no matter how tempting. The hallway of the apartment complex was dark, illuminated only by the ruddy yellow light above the stairwell and the glowing red exit sign at the end of the hall. I approached my own apartment door, listening. It was quiet, all except for the electric buzz of a malfunctioning light from the other side. When I opened the door, I was greeted with a darkened room and the sight of Daniel standing on a step stool in the center of the kitchen, screwing a light bulb into the ceiling. Ah, oh, it burned out, he said, grunting as he tried to get the bulb in tight. But I've almost got it. There, finally. You okay? As I watched the flickering light stabilize at last and cast a glow back onto the room, my absent mind began to thaw itself out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. God, I wish they'd put an elevator in, though. As I watched the ladder underneath Dan's feet jiggle under his tiniest movements, I cringed. Yeah, I'll give you a present if you promise to get down off that rickety thing before you, like, bust your skull open or something, you know? I reached into my newly purchased groceries and grabbed a bag of chips tossing it towards Daniel once his feet were on solid ground again. I couldn't help the smirk on my face as I fumbled both of his hands in an attempt to catch it before it hit the floor. It's the dinner of champions, I told him. He squeezed both sides of the bag, letting it pop open and wincing as he prepared for the jump scare it gave him. Barbecue potato chips? I was already munching on my own bag of greasy goodness. I was surprised to hear him bitching, especially since the last time I tried to cook dinner for the three of us. I sort of burned the soup. Who burned soup? Champions aren't picky, Daniel. Eat your fucking chips. I had the night off. Dan was going to take over after Finn and I would take the morning shift, giving me time to settle in and unpack. In the time we had before his departure, we ate junk food and used the dodgy public Wi-Fi to watch dumb videos on the internet. But as I watched my coworker prepare to leave, 
I was faced with an unfamiliar anxiety. The safety and ignorance of being on the outside. I wanted to be happy to have a place to live outside of that godforsaken wooden tower. I was proud of myself, and, and I was excited for this new adventure, but why wasn't I happy? Before he went, Daniel insisted on one more picture. One of the both of us to immortalize a hard day's work. This time, we both made silly faces. He handed me the Polaroid and I stuck it to the fridge like a piece of macaroni art. Thanks for the help, Danny boy, I said, handing him his bag. His smile was generous and reliable. Selfless as always. Don't mention it, he said. Let's just say you owe me one. Breakfast is on you tomorrow, okay? He put a hand on the top of my head, ruffling my hair into a ginger bird's nest. Get some sleep, freckle face. I'll see you when we trade shifts. He left. The tap of his Oxfords disappearing down the stairwell. Now it was just me, a room full of boxes, and an ever-persistent case of anxiety as I noticed the view of the trees from my place on the fifth floor. I could see everything from up here. It was snowing outside. It built up on the sides of the road, leaving the black pavement wet and glistening. A bell rang out nine times, coming from the little church two streets down. The sound was shrill and metallic. I pulled a dusty, battery-operated radio out of the storage, settling it down on the floor next to the sofa after programming my morning alarm. The old antique still had some Sharpie marker stains on the bottom. F.M., it said. Frank McKinnon. A pale memory came back to me of sitting in a truck bed in the summer while wearing my dad's coat, watching the stars and listening to the radio. I didn't really know any better back then. God, man, I forgot I even had this thing. If I focused really hard, it still smelled a bit like the old fire station. Smoke and gasoline. You know, I've been thinking about him a lot lately. Curiously, I turned the dial finding that rare in-between station that I knew oh so well. 104.6 FM. An even number. Anywhere else in the country, it would probably be static. But here, it was the only station you could get. I heard the muffled voice of our part-timer, Finn, on the other end. His bored and deadpan tone reading out the end of the weather forecast. It was going to be a foggy night, he said. A good night to stay indoors. A good night to keep the doors locked and the radio on. I put my pillow on the other side of the couch so that I didn't have to face the window while I slept. <laughs> I think I should have picked up some curtains. This is Evelyn McKinnon from 104.6 FM. And despite everything, we're still on the air. Just after the stroke of midnight, my whole world changed. I sat there, drunk and cold in the dark of early morning, but the hour was far from quiet. There was blood on the floor, on the window. The neighbors were still sobbing, probably holding each other close, praying for it to be over. And I was alone, looking out at the streets of town where destruction stretches as far as the eye can see. Before it all went wrong, it started with a sound. A drone. A bellow that shook the whole earth. A siren. A fog warning is being issued for the village of Pine Haven. 
The crackle of the radio pulled me out of a deep, cold sleep. I rolled suddenly and fell off the couch, the back of my head hitting the floor with a loud thud. The siren was blaring over the entirety of our quiet mountain village, like a single scream in the dead of night. I'd never heard it from this side of the forest before. The tone of Daniel's voice, however, was more alarming. He was shaken to the core. He had done this before many, many times, in fact. So why was his voice trembling now? Please stay indoors until instructed to do otherwise. Close and lock all windows. Do not, do not go outside. Do not, uh, do not. He went quiet. Still wrapped in a twisted blanket, I squinted at the radio as white noise started to break through. With a tired, ornery grunt, I grabbed it, smacking it with the palm of my hand. I gave it a shake, tried adjusting the station, even turned it on and off again. All I heard was white noise in every direction. Almost as if 104.6 FM didn't exist anymore. You'd think that years into this sort of thing, I'd kind of be used to that horse shit, but the jitters would go away or something. Thinking about Danny spending the night in the tower by himself reminded me way too much of my own first days. And I knew he didn't like to be alone. The radio was placed back down, and almost as if on cue, a light from outside my window went dark. I squinted at the frosted glass. It was the street lamp beneath my floor flickered a few times and then went out completely and was soon followed by the lamp beside it. As I pushed the blankets off my legs and my skin was touched by the chill in an unheated room, that small view of the quiet downtown street became clear. I rushed to the window, bare feet shocked by the cold floor. Down every street that I could see, Lights were going out one by one on the roadside and people's windows, in the sky, it looked like the stars were going out, one by one. I felt a tightness growing in my chest as I watched the night sky grow black. A heavy cloud was passing over. It was a cloud that reached the ground, a heavy, swirling fog that went on for miles and miles up the mountain. It reached us, and somewhere in a matter of minutes, it had passed the forest boundary, and it had reached us. Ever since I came back to Pine Haven and began my shitty little hero's journey, I had never, ever seen it from this view. <laughs> the powerless view of the observer, locked behind closed doors with no choice but to wait out the nightmare as the siren blared over us all. The people in the village must have been terrified, just as they always were, but I knew something that most of them didn't. If the fog reached the town, it only meant one thing. The radio signal had stopped. 104.6 FM had lost its operator. We weren't safe anymore. I swore loudly, stubbing my toe on one of the boxes strewn around the kitchenette, knocking them over with an avalanche of noise. I felt drunk in the dark as I searched blindly for my phone, patting every surface until finally it was found between the couch cushions. My eye burned as soon as the lit screen flooded my face, but I squinted through the discomfort as my thumbs got to typing. Luckily, my list of contacts was pretty small. Daniel was easy to find. The line rang once, then twice. I sat down on the living room floor next to the couch, legs curled up to tuck my cold feet underneath me. There was a third ring, a fourth, and then silence. God damn, you walnut, just pick up your phone. I couldn't even enjoy the simple pleasure of insulting my best friend when my heart was beating a mile per minute. He didn't pick up. As Daniel's voicemail greeted me once again, I canceled the call and prepared to try it once more, not satisfied until something came through on the other line. God, please don't be dead. Please don't be dead. 
He didn't pick up. Again. I heard car alarms, police sirens. The town was starting to go mad as the fog drifted over the business district, leaving some unseen path of destruction in its wake on the other side of town. There's only one thing left to do. Get in my truck and drive. Finn called me on my cell phone and I picked up immediately. Fog's outside my house, he said, gruff and angry, but I could still hear panic in his voice. Where the fuck is Daniel? I don't know. I trembled as I tried to find my boots in the dark. The lights weren't working. He, he's not picking up and the radio's out. I, I, I think he's... Don't think. Finn was stern with me. Just go. Someone has to activate the bell and, I, and I'm... On the other end of the phone, I heard the shatter of glass and a loud rumble as if Finn's house was falling apart. He dropped his voice down to a whisper, breathing heavily as doors slammed and feet stomped. He was on the move. Oh, fuck, it's too late for me to go. They're already here, they're- I heard a heavy thump. Fuck, they're in the house. I'll- I'll try the cellar. It's the only place I've left. <sighs> Goodbye for now, Evelyn. Good luck. I hope we meet again soon, but uh, if not, it was an honor and, and I'm- I'm so sorry. He hung up on me. In the end, his voice quivered as if on the verge of tears, and it was the first time I had ever heard him sound defeated. Scared. And all I could think was that those words were the last I would ever hear from Finn. God, all these years, and I didn't even know his first name. Stumbling in the dark, I put my boots on, but I didn't even bother to lace them up. I left my coat behind, fully prepared to step out the front door in a pair of boxer shorts and a sleeveless shirt as I raced out of the room and started to make my way down the stairs. There were already people in the hallway, trying to get down for a closer look. I was one of them. I pushed my way through the crowd and down to the front exit of the building where the square glass windows showed a world of pure gray. It was too late. The fog had reached the building and we were surrounded, an icy, cold draft seeping underneath the door and dark figures shifting within the mist. Everything was deathly silent for a moment. And then, bang! Something heavy knocked against the door, making the metal hinges whine. It happened again, and everyone in the crowd jumped as the glass began to crack. One person screamed. Another was running back up the stairs. All at once, the glass shattered, and the fog started to seep into the apartment building, filling the hall and rolling towards us at an alarming pace. Everyone go! Go, 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 go! I yelled, pushing anyone near me towards the stairwell. Back upstairs! Get inside! Lock your doors! Just, just, just go! A man looked me in the face. He must have seen the terror I wore, or else he recognized my voice from the radio, because as soon as our eyes met, he started to help push back the crowds, trusting that I knew what I was doing. People were fleeing back to their apartments as the doors continued to shake, something strong attempting to fight its way in. The crowd was congested, and some people too afraid to even move, and others stumbling over one another. But we, <laughs> we weren't quick enough. Long, gray, spider-like limbs reached in through the broken window, followed by another, and another from a beast with many arms. Some human, and some animal. It grabbed the nearest person, a young man, and pulled him toward the door until his back cracked against the dented metal. <laughs> Fuck! The way it broke him to pieces with its hands, I, I don't even want to describe it. All I need you to know is that it was dragged part of his body out through the window and the rest dropped to the floor, spraying the crowd with blood. I wasn't spared from the mess. The crowd finally began to move faster, frantic and screaming. One of those long, crooked limbs reached through the window and grabbed me by the leg, 
claws digging into my flesh and tearing it open. I was holding onto the stairwell for dear life, almost sure that I would be torn apart as well. The creature only dropped me when a brave neighbor stomped a heavy boot down on the limb, cracking the brittle bone. I raced up to the fifth floor, dragging the injured leg behind me, and as I slammed the door to the apartment, the last thing I saw was a view of the stairwell and something large and fleshy crawling up the stairs on dozens of mutated, mismatched limbs. Oh god, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was trapped here. There's no way to get to the broadcast room, and, and Daniel was just gone. Finn was gone. I, I pulled out my phone again, and I called, and I called, and called, and called, but nothing happened. No one would answer me. I, I was the only one left. I tried texting Daniel. Where are you? Are you okay? Answer me. Please. Nothing. I started to hyperventilate, tears running down my face as I realized that this... This could be the end. The end of it all. I grabbed the radio in both hands, gripping it tightly as I sat on the floor and rocked back and forth. Something was lumbering outside my door, banging on the walls as it went up and down the hallway, looking for a way in. I focused on the radio, the smell of smoke and, and gasoline, and the last memory I had of my father, and the photo on the fridge, the last memory of my best friend. But something broke through the white noise. I heard Dan's voice. It, it was soft shivering and disjointed through the sound. No, you're not real. You're not real. He whispered. He was alive. The crackle of the radio interrupted his quiet murmurs and turned to white noise again, but God, he was alive. With a turn of the dial, the garbled sounds and ear-piercing screeches became louder until a few taps against the plastic began to clear the airwaves. That's not true. That's not true. I would never. Daniel sounded far away, his voice carrying a frail tremble. Between the white noise and the moments of static, I heard the squeak of a rolling chair and the scuff of an arm against the table. He was leaving his seat. I kept calling. He ignored me every time, and, and no matter how many times I tried to shout his name, he would never hear me. God, don't go out there. I found myself thinking, whatever you do, whatever you do, just don't you dare go out there, you dumb son of a bitch. In an instant, all the noise stopped. The radio gave one final shriek of static before it fell to silence, and the connection that I had was gone. All signals was lost. I, I couldn't call, I couldn't text. Daniel and I were suddenly worlds apart. That mile between us may as well just have been an ocean. But a flickering light through the window struck me as something new. In those distracted moments, I couldn't see the layer of fog that was now completely covering every inch of our sleepy mountain town and beyond. The streets below disappeared, fading into an obscure lump of blurry color and shape. Some of those shapes were moving, all the while not too far away. The solitary glow of a single street lamp began to pulse and flicker until it burst in a quick, startling shower of electricity. I could hear the crack of wood and the groan of taut wire as the vague outline of a telephone pole began to fall apart and crash into the pavement. It was followed by several more. The town was falling apart. Car alarms were blaring, the ground was shaking, fire hydrants burst open. Down the street, gunshots rang out and screams followed. Doors slammed, windows shattered, and somewhere downstairs, the fellow apartment building tenants ran up and down the halls, and I was not the only one huddled against the window just watching to see what was out there. Whatever it was took large footsteps. It snapped wires, sending sparks flying. In those tiny glimmers of electric light, 
I could see the faint, sharp silhouette of long, gnarled horns. My skin began to crawl as I realized just how tall it stood. Tall enough to push the telephone poles down with ease. It lumbered slowly, voicing the low roars of a massive and ancient beast. No. No, not him. Not him. Beneath me, I heard a scream before I saw anything. A young girl in the apartment below shrieked and her voice was soon muffled and replaced by the comforting shush of a parent. Moments later, I saw it for myself. A family of vines began to crawl their way up from the corner of the window, growing and spreading over the glass as they made their way up the building at least five stories high. What first appeared as slithering plant life soon became something different. Its blossoms opened. And within, I could see the wriggling of blood-soaked fingers that crawled out from between its petals, connected to the vine where their wrists would be. They were molded and gray, like the skin of something long drowned. These tiny, vaguely human hands began to paw and scrape and scratch at the window glass. They had no eyes to see me, but they clawed at the glass with a sharp, ear-splitting sound. They knew someone was on the inside. I still can't put my finger on why it felt worse to see the fog from here than it did to see it from inside the forest itself, and, and perhaps I just felt... helpless. Out here, there was nothing I could do. Out here... All I could do was watch as the world ended. A set of giant footsteps grew closer, and the used cups on my kitchen counter began to shiver and shake precariously close to the edge. Before I could react, one of them slid off, shattering on the floor. The sound of breaking glass was nowhere near as unpleasant as the sharp scrape of antlers against the side of the building. The behemoth thing was close enough to dip its head, as if peering into the windows of my downstairs neighbors, its horns scratching on the brick. And when it turned its head closer, I saw it. Many pairs of eyes glowing through the thick, swirling fog as a warm mist formed on the window from its breath. It made a sound like a low, droning death rattle. The cry of an elk followed, but it was low and alien. In my memory, I could smell it still. The amalgamation of soil, mold, and old rotten flesh. <laughs> One of those eyes used to be mine, but now it was dead and blind. I wondered if the beast remembered. My foot caught a slice of broken glass when I turned and I hissed down in pain before rushing to the bathroom. I slammed the door behind me. The power was out and I was plunged into total darkness, listening to the sound of whispers coming from the sink. The pitch black room was far more comfortable, however, than the peering eyes of the beast outside. The sink began to gurgle, a black fluid bubbling up from within the pipes. It dripped down the porcelain and onto the floor by my feet where it hissed and bubbled like boiling water. I crawled away from it, backed up into a corner like a tiny ball. And the floor shook as tremors passed through the building and I could hear the screams of neighbors between the walls. Neighbors who had been too curious or had left their doors unlocked. I couldn't say how long it lasted. And perhaps it was a minute or an hour. It felt agonizing, like time had decided to stand still. But the end of it all didn't come in the form of screams and panic. It came in a siren, too high for any to hear, and one that I only recognized from the howls of all the town's dogs wailing from within the walls of their homes. The bell. I whispered, 
my voice a quiet puff of breath. I leaned against the wall limply, hands over my racing thought. You finally did it. You finally did it, Danny boy. I had no curiosity to watch the fog dissipate, or to watch the departing silhouettes of whatever beasts had emerged. I waited, my back to the door, until I felt ready to come out of the bathroom. When I did, they were gone. The streets were left in disrepair, with snapped power lines across the roads, scattered shingles torn from rooftops, and huge marks in the snow where gargantuan hooves had stepped. And there were cracks in the drywall, dust falling from the ceiling. And the quakes that tore through the apartment building left my items scattered across the floor. Even on my window, I saw the stains of old, murky-colored blood from the hands that scratched too hard on the glass in an attempt to get in. There was a crack in the corner. They had almost succeeded. I got a text message. It was from Finn. Simply said, I think they're gone now. With a relieved sigh, I stuffed my phone back in my pocket, deciding to leave the quiet darkness of my apartment to follow a new procession of footsteps that rushed up and down the hallways. I wasn't the only one eager and anxious to see it all for myself. There was blood in the hallway. Trails of blood. Some of my new neighbors didn't make it out alive. Down the stairs and at the end of the hallway, a small crowd had already formed with their hands and faces pressed against the glass and peering through the bursted door. As my neighbors began to hesitantly creep outside, I pushed my way through until my bare and bloodied feet hit the cold cement. The streets of Pinehaven were dark, lit only by wandering flashlights and the occasional spark from a broken street lamp. I could hear the mixture of hushed whispers and distressed shouts. Somewhere down the sidewalk, a man was running from gate to gate, asking hurriedly if anyone had seen his wife out for her evening walk. People were crying. Police sirens were already blaring, lights appearing down the road as they parked around the hazards to keep people from getting too close. <laughs> but everything was a hazard, really. I reached into my memory then, thinking of the sirens I used to hear as a child and the way that my mother would close the curtains whenever the fog rolled in. Sometimes we'd sit in the basement. Back then? I didn't know. Back then... It was never this bad. <laughs> then again, I drank those memories away. My back pocket began to buzz and I grabbed for it with cold, unsteady hands and nearly dropped it on the pavement in the process. It was Daniel's number. Pushing and shoving my way back inside the apartment, I put it up to my ear and winced with each step that I took on my injured leg. Daniel? I answered, hearing a crackle on the other end. The signal was poor, but began to clear the closer I got to the stairs. I did it. His voice came through at long last. I felt a weight lift off of my shoulders. Even if he sounded shaken, it was still undoubtedly and positively him. It was... I can't explain it. I don't know what I saw. It, it's fine. It's okay. I assured a bit breathless when I reached the top of the stairs. Just, just breathe. You got it under control, right? That's all that matters. Fuck, I'm so glad to hear your voice. You, you have no idea. I, I was beginning to think that... On the other end of the phone, I could hear the unsteady breaths of someone still struggling to pull themselves together. He was crying. I could tell. I tried my best to assure him and keep him at ease, all the while pinching my phone between my cheek and shoulder, as I struggled to unstick the old apartment door. It swung open and once again I was in the dark with the scent of mildew and quiet, static riddled music coming from the radio by the couch. Are you gonna be okay? I asked, plopping myself down on the sofa and idly picking at the bottom of my foot in search of tiny pieces of glass. You don't sound great, bud. I'll be fine. He told me, his nose stuffed. It was just worse than I remember. Uh, the fog came in quick and I just 
I don't think I was ready for it this time. My ears still hurt like hell, though. I remember the first time he'd activated the bell. <laughs> Poor sucker had to rip out his hearing aid because the frequency was so harsh. Daniel gave a small sniffle, and in the background I could hear the landline ringing constantly. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I feel like it's a lot smarter than it used to be. Those things are getting pretty good at using stairs. I felt... I, I felt like they came straight for me, like they had a plan to try to lure me out. Or maybe I'm just losing all my remaining marbles. <laughs> it took you long enough, I said with a half-spirited smirk. And Daniel snorted in response. Here we were yet again, trying to laugh when nothing was funny. <laughs> it was a lot harder this time. What about you? Dan asked. You were out there in the middle of it, right? Is everything in town okay? As I felt the tackiness of blood on my fingertips, I abandoned my injured foot and looked up to the window still seeing the distant glow of the police lights flashing on every street corner. I dreaded seeing what it looked like in the daylight. It's fine. I'm, I'm fine, I told him. Oh, it wasn't so bad. There was a long lapse of silence on the other end of the phone. We were both keeping plenty to ourselves, it seemed. <laughs> Too afraid to let the worst of it kind of be known. Daniel let on a light huff of breath. I don't believe you. He said. I can see the flashing lights from here. Cops are out on the road. Now it's just a few down power lines. A lie of the century right there. Eh, don't worry. Our appointment building is still here. It was, you know, it was like, uh, it was like a storm. That's all. Besides, cops are always out on the roads. They don't have anything else to do. I didn't want him to know. Not yet. He was having a bad enough time as it was. He didn't need to sit all night with the knowledge that the fog had destroyed part of the town. People had died. I didn't blame him. But I did know that he would blame himself. <laughs> he had always been too good for this place. You know, I could drive out there if you wanted me to, I told him. I'd be up there in just a few minutes, and then you wouldn't have to be alone. I, I, could, I could bring Finn too, and, and we could just sit together, you know? The three of us? Daniel paused for a moment, as if thinking it over. No, it's okay. But maybe you can just sit with me on the phone for a few more minutes. You know, and until you want to go back to sleep. He knew better. We didn't sleep. Not when the fog was still in the mountains. On nights like these, when it loomed over the town and watched us from afar, there was never a possibility of rest. He was right about one thing. It was getting smarter. As I looked down at the destruction, mountains looming in the background, I knew that the forest was already trying to find its way back to us. Sure, Danny boy. I went to the kitchen, already getting a pot of coffee ready to start my day at 2 a.m. I eyed the bottle of tequila on the counter for a moment before breaking off the seal and taking a sip straight from the bottle. Oh god. It hit my throat with a pleasant heat that I once promised I would never feel again. I'll be here as long as you need me, Danny. This is Evelyn McKinnon from 104.6 FM. And I don't think Pine Haven is ever going to be the same after tonight. Neither will we. Once again, I find myself here, logging into Evelyn's account. Writing up the events of the day. This is Dan, by the way. I'll start by saying Lynn is fine. Unlike last time, she's not arrested. She's not in the hospital missing more body parts. She's here at work. Currently crouching on the fire escape like a gargoyle and pestering Bartholomew. Trying to get him to eat a bean burrito. It's been a couple of days since the fog. And honestly, I just... 
I wanted to tell my story, and lucky for me, Lynn still hasn't changed her laptop password. It's password, by the way. When the fog subsided, the place was a mess. The radio tower was fine, but the shed outside is half collapsed, the fire escapes leaning more than usual. Finn's already working on it. They got dozens of phone calls at the radio station that night. The police chief was furious, saying that he would have fired me on the spot if he had someone willing to take my place. People were confused. They were angry. Some of them didn't know what had happened, and others... Others seemed to know exactly what had happened, and wanted answers. It's the strangest storm I've ever seen, an elderly woman told me. Ripped the hinges right off my front door. My husband, he was out to check for the generator, and he hasn't come back. But there's holes in the ground outside, big ones. And the roof of our shed was completely ripped off. And the smell! As soon as the call ended, another came in. The man on the other end sounded furious. My chickens are inside out. All of them. Now what the hell does that? Turns them inside out. I tell you, I've never seen a mess like this in my whole life. When I find out what son of a bitch got in the coop and did this, well, let's just say my shotgun's gonna be waiting. Inside out. Can you believe it? The final call of the night was the worst. The woman was crying. Such hysterics that I could hardly understand at first. Ma'am? I said sternly. Ma'am, calm down. Can you repeat what you just said, please? My, my son? She sobbed. Please, if anyone's seen my son, bring him home to me. He's only nine. His name is M Michael. God, my chest hurts. Why did it have to be a child? Why did it always have to be a child? Where'd you last see him? I asked. There was a long pause on the other end of the phone, an eerie silence that didn't prepare me for what she would say next. Floating above the roof, she said softly. He, he was floating above the roof as limp as a rag doll, and then he just disappeared into the fog. He never came back down. As bad as the calls were, it wasn't the worst thing. All night, until the first rays of sunshine rose over the mountains, there was something standing at the edge of the tree line. It was watching me for hours smiling at me. And when I wasn't standing at the window, it would just stare into the security camera knowing that I was on the other side. It's still hunting me. The thing I met on the stairwell. I can't begin to describe how good it felt to hand over the keys that morning. After all that had happened in the span of a few hours, Evelyn's tired face at 5 a.m. was the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen. She arrived an hour before her shift, her nose red from the cold air and lips chapped. She had scratches on her face, her eyes bloodshot. She looked clammy. She had a fever. Even so, I was happy to see her. Being alone never suited me, to be honest. I still don't know how Evelyn and Finn can handle being here by themselves so often, taking this pressure alone. I think I'd make a better co-host than a host. But now it was a brand new day, a brand new morning, right? Finally, it was my turn to go home and leave the station in the capable hands of this little weirdo that I called my friend. Before she even said anything, I pulled Lynn into a big hug, scooping her up while she struggled to stay on her tiptoes. She wasn't a big hugger, I knew that. But I think she could tell I needed it, because she didn't try to wiggle away this time. She was freezing cold had snow sticking to her coat and hat, but I still found myself not wanting to let go. Morning, bitch mittens. <laughs> Evelyn said, sweetly, patting me on the back. Even our morning ritual of new insulting nicknames couldn't change the relief I felt to have my friend with me. I laughed softly, weakly. Good morning, you little tapeworm. I gave her one last squeeze and finally let her go. She stumbled, flat-footed on the floor, before holding up a box of donuts. She grinned and chuckled like a little goblin, showing off her spoils. You remembered breakfast, I commented. I figured you earned it, Evelyn said, as she closed the door behind her, taking off her winter coat but leaving the dark green beanie on her head. 
She began to set up her things for the day. I hope you don't mind. I got him at the rest stop. You know, the one on the mountainside road with the rats. It was the only place that was open this early. <laughs> as long as the rats aren't an ingredient, I don't care, I said. And my smile disappeared when I noticed that she was limping. What happened to your leg? I asked, pointing at the one she seemed to be favoring. She looked down, picking up her boot gingerly. Oh, uh, you know, the usual. Got hit by a truck, broke all my bones. <laughs> no, I just stepped on something sharp. Don't worry about it, my guy. I didn't get the sense she was lying to me. Only that maybe she wasn't giving me all the details. How about you? Are you feeling okay? We both knew that physically I was fine. I had been safely tucked in the tower all night, exhausted but otherwise completely untouched. But Evelyn had known me for years now. She knew when something wasn't right, and there was no use in hiding something from her when she already knew the truth just from looking at my face. I'm okay, now, I said. It was a half-truth. Last night was rough. You were late to the broadcast. Evelyn pointed out as she picked a donut from the box. She didn't say it with a condescending tone, like she was scolding me. Rather, she just sounded concerned and worried that this might happen again. The question was hanging in the air. Why? She didn't ask it out loud, but I could feel it. There was guilt in the bottom of my heart, because I knew that... Anything that happened in town last night was my fault. It happened really quickly, that's all, I answered, avoiding her gaze as best I could. The one big blue eye of hers had a way of searching my soul for the truth. Before I knew what was happening, the, the fog was already here, and something was pounding on the door, talking to me, trying to convince me to go with it. Evelyn gave me a look, frowning on her lips and her eyes one eye narrowing in suspicion. We were both wondering the same thing. When did they learn to do that? Suddenly, the abominations from the woods had found their voices. They learned the rules of the game, and they were trying to break them. Lynn was quiet, thinking to herself as she leaned against the desk and shoved part of a donut in her mouth. I noticed a fluttering of wings outside the window. Bartholomew had finally arrived to check on things perching outside on the fire escape and ruffling his feathers to get rid of the snow they had gathered. <coughs> Evelyn licked her fingers and broke her donut in half, rushing over to the fire escape. She turned off the alarm and slipped out, dropping part of the pastry in one of the bird feeders that we had placed outside the window. It was my idea. Finn put them up for us last year. Here you go, you little shit beast. Don't say I never gave you nothing. Bartholomew responded by chirping at her shrilly and then pecking at the donut, getting crumbs everywhere. Lynn even tried to pet him, but the bird snapped his beak at her fingers, nearly giving her a nasty bite. He still didn't like her. At all. And Evelyn, in a predictably display of 100% unfiltered dumbassery, snapped her teeth at the bird in response, that she was about to bite him back. She would bite a bird, I think, if you gave her the chance and maybe a $5 bill. If you've been wondering, yes, this stupid feud has been going on this entire time. Years have passed, and Lynn still wants nothing more than to fight a goddamn sparrow. Or a... chickadee? I don't know. I'm not a bird scientist. Evelyn came back into the broadcast room, shaking snow out of her hair. Hey, Danny, why don't you, uh, take off? I think I got it under control now. Barty will help me keep an eye on the place. <laughs> Ugh. She leaned against the desk, keeping her weight on one foot. Go home. Get some sleep. Like, take a bubble bath or something. Just get the forest stink off of you. As much as I didn't like seeing Lynn spend the day here all by herself, I was eager to take her up on that offer. I buttoned my coat, slipped a pair of gloves on my hands, preparing for how cold the seat of my old station wagon would be. Here's the keys. I left today's news line up on the desk. Oh, and I made you a pot of coffee. I gestured to the kitchen, then grabbed a donut for the road. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon, okay? Sure will. She smiled at me, but there was sadness there. Now I know the reason why. 
She knew what I would find at the end of the road. Safe travels, cowboy. I shoved the pastry in my mouth on the way down the rickety old winding stairs, but when I got to the bottom I noticed that my car was covered in more than just frost. Broken twigs, dead leaves covered it from top to bottom, as well as long streaks of mud across the sides. At least, I think it was mud. There was a dent in one door that hadn't been there before, and one of the side view mirrors was completely missing. I made an exasperated sound as I threw my bag in the back seat and got to work trying to scrape all the frozen dirt off the windshield. The back window was even more cracked than it had been before. Just my luck. Hey, thanks a lot! I shouted into the woods while throwing parts of the tree branches as far as I could. I really appreciate it, assholes. It's what I always wanted. Jesus, Mary, and... Ugh. When I got into my car, I was in a rotten mood, tapping my fingers across the steering wheel impatiently. On the drive home, I saw the full extent of what had happened the night before. Power lines were down. Streets were closed off. There were potholes in the road big enough to fall into. Windows were shattered down the business district, and a few doors were hanging off their hinges. A few roofs had even caved in. There was one traffic light in the whole town, and now it was dangling in the middle of the intersection. Evelyn never told me about all this. My God. This was my fault. When I got to the apartment building, it wasn't any better. There was a dark, slimy residue against the bricks all the way up to the top floor. Some of them shaped like little handprints. I could see Lynn's windows smeared and cracked. Curtains were drawn, the power was out. A pile of broken glass crunched under my feet as I stepped up to the door, and I noticed bloody footprints against the pavement. The door was dented and the windows were broken, letting the cold in. Someone had attempted to put duct tape over it, but it only did so much good. I'd managed my way around a cleaning crew who were mopping up the floors. The water in the buckets was a deep red. I passed a few of my neighbors, but we didn't look one another in the eye. Briefly, I... I wondered if they knew. I wondered if they... They blamed me, too. I don't think I took more than five steps into the apartment before I was already falling onto the bed face first. Before I could even kick off my shoes or take out my hearing aid, the mental and emotional exhaustion of the night completely shut me down. I fell into a deep sleep. My dreams were cold that morning. I felt as if I had been submerged in freezing water, floating in a sea of pure ice without a surface to swim towards. My body was just suspended, floating, drifting. All around me I saw shadows moving in one direction, as if a magnetic force was pulling them in. I started to float, too, just another ghost amongst the rest. In my dream I heard a bellow from the deep. Well, the whole world shook, and even though my feet didn't touch the ground, I still felt it all the way down in my bones. The ground cracked and opened before us, and the icy cold void ahead of me, I saw a bright magenta-colored light rising out of the dark. We were all drifting towards it. The shadows and I, drawn to an endless pit like lambs to slaughter. The figures ahead of me began to fall, further and deeper until they disappeared into the light. One by one, they were eaten alive. Until I was the only one left. I was so cold I was shivering. Hardly able to feel my fingers and toes. Wait, my toes. I was touching the ground again. I was standing on two feet, shoes still on hearing the sudden crunch of twigs beneath me as if I had just fallen onto the forest floor. With a startled breath, my eyes flew open, and I fell back into my body once again. I felt so disoriented, so confused, so absolutely fucking freezing. It was dark. I was outside, I was looking around, I saw snow and trees and shrubs and... Oh no. Oh no, oh god. What had I done? I turned to one side, then the other, spinning in a circle to try to find my way out. I was in the woods. I was deep in the woods. Far enough to see nothing but rows and rows of pines surrounding me. I, I had no light, no coat, nothing but a hearing aid in my head and the clothes I'd fallen into bed wearing. Was I still asleep? 
Wake up! I shouted, slapping myself in the face. Wake up, you idiot! Wake up! It didn't accomplish anything except make my right cheek sore and red. This wasn't real. This wasn't happening. I was still at home, asleep in my bed, having restless dreams because of a really, really terrible day, right? I pinched my arm as hard as I could, but all it did was hurt. I could see my breath with each trembling exhale, and my eyes were already stinging in the winter air. God, it was dark. It was so dark, so, so dark, that the only tiny bit of solace I could find was in the brief moments when the moon peered from behind the cloud. How long had I been asleep? How long had I been in the woods? How long before morning? I couldn't stay here. I mean, no matter how lost I was, by now we had learned the forest didn't need a foggy day to get violent. It just needed a victim stupid enough to walk into its clutches like an insect flying into a trap. I was in their territory now. Every part of me wanted to shout and scream, to call out for help and hope that someone could hear me. But what if something else heard me? What if it already knew I was here? I picked a direction and walked, noticing that the ground seemed to tilt downward more on one side than the other. So long as I made my way down from the mountain, I'd find a way out. All the while, my eyes were scanning the horizon for the light to the radio tower, with the faint hope that maybe I was close to the station. I couldn't see it yet. Slowly, I took another step. My foot snapped a twig beneath me, and I winced the echo making every hair on my back and my neck stand on end. I paused for a moment, just listening, waiting. Perhaps if I, if I stood still enough, nothing could catch me, but, but I heard it. Another twig, another snap. It was close by. My heart started pounding and I held my breath, too scared to move. The only thing I could do was turn my eyes a little to the left. Seeing a shadow standing between the trees, just, just a few yards away. It stood completely still, facing me in absolute silence. I was afraid to take my eyes off the thing, and it didn't seem to want to look away from me either. We were the same size, the same shape. If I didn't know better, I would have thought that it was my own shadow. Fuck. The way my stomach turned when I realized what I was looking at almost made me sick on the spot. I recognized it. The thing that wore my face. We met on the stairs, this shadow and I staring at one another through the window while he pounded on the door demanding that I let him in. It spoke to me. I, I, I didn't know they could speak like that. This one did. But how did it get in my face? I dared to take a single step in the opposite direction, keeping my eyes on the black mass between the tree trunks. When I moved, it stepped in the same direction like a mirror image. I stepped again, it stepped again. I moved my arm up above my head, and the doppelganger did the same. Two more steps I took, walking backwards while the strange vision walked forwards, always keeping the same speed and distance away from me. We stood still. The creature and I, just staring at one another. Maybe it was just playing a game, maybe toying with me for its own amusement was enough. Somewhere up the mountain I heard a low bellow like the voice of an elk and a whale mixed together. I had to go. I, I picked up my foot, ready to take another step in the original direction, but I noticed the shadow twitch. Its head snapped, its shoulders rising and prickling in defense. All at once the thing broke into a full sprint towards me and I immediately dug my heels under the ground and started to run. My lungs were burning in the cold air. My shoes were soaked with snow and ice, but the discomfort couldn't stop me. I was blinded by terror, watching trees fly by as I stumbled over roots and branches all the way. The forest was alive around me. Even the plants seemed to move and lean in my direction as if trying to get up and run after me. Small animals streaked and scampered away from my path. Faintly, I could hear the cry and sobs of human voices calling out in pure agony in every single direction. All those lost souls, ghosts, drifting through the pines. They were trying to take me with them, thin arms sprouting from the trees like bodies sewn into the bark, trapped forever. The footsteps behind me were growing faster, louder. The shadow was gaining on me, snarling and howling as it went. Oh my god, I knew I was going to die, I could sense it. The forest was swallowing me whole, and there was absolutely no end in sight, but then, like a beacon on the horizon, I saw a tiny red light. It was the very tip of the radio tower. 
I was so close to escape, so close to safety. Just a little while longer is all I needed, but the thing on my heels was gaining closer every moment. Its heavy footfalls even louder than before, as if the beast had grown in size. All around me, the ground began to shake, and I knew one misstep would be the end of me. Some of the trees looked upside down, floating in the air, but I, I couldn't tell if it was real or if it was just me in my head. I was already thinking of all the things I had never done. Oh God, so many goals were left behind to rot, so many things I never did, things unsaid to people who mattered to me. I was going to die before becoming a person worth being proud of. Who wants to die a miserable, pathetic fuck-up? No, no, these weren't my thoughts. The shadow was in my head now, whispering to me, putting these words in my head. It's time to give up, it hissed. Give up and let me win. It's what you want. It's what you've always wanted for all of this to be over. The trees were growing thinner. I could see a field of snow ahead. And finally, the clearing was near. Just a few more steps. That's all it took. So why did I want to stop? Why, for a split second in time, did I want to just... Let the forest take me. It would be so easy to just stop running, wouldn't it? It would be quick, I'm sure. Maybe not painless, but quick. I heard that voice again, my voice. You can end it. I can help you. You won't even feel a thing. But I could see the radio tower. I could see the old firewatch lights on the inside, figure standing by the window. Evelyn was looking at one of the monitors for the security cameras. I watched her drop her cup of coffee, immediately rush to the door to unlock the fire escape. She saw me. And I knew that if I gave up now, she'd bring me back from the dead just to kick my ass. I practically flew from the tree line and into the snow, stumbling and falling on my way to the fire escape. At the top, Evelyn already had the door unlocked and open. Her stark white and freckled face regarding me with terror and confusion. The thing behind me was still growling and snarling with every step I made in those metal stairs. Clang, 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 one loud, heavy step at a time. Two pairs of feet. When I reached the top, I threw myself into the broadcasting room and screamed at Evelyn, Close it! Close the fucking door! She did as I said, slamming the door shut and locking it behind me. I pushed her to the other side of the room as I started to barricade it with chairs, a table, anything I could find. I was trembling from head to foot, but I didn't know if it was mostly from the cold or from the fear of almost certain death. Evelyn was grabbing her winter coat. Dan? She spoke sternly. Dan, slow down. Jesus Christ, slow down. I finally backed away from the door, breathing heavily and feeling lightheaded. I stumbled and I fell to the floor. Which time Lynn quickly put her coat over my shoulders and held my arms tightly to my sides. Man, what the absolute fuck were you doing? She asked as soon as my trembling began to subside. Her voice wavered with so much anxiety. It was aggressive and furious at the same time. She began to pace around the room, shaking with anger. How did you even get out there? It's almost midnight, Dan. And after yesterday? After we thought you were gone? You, you could have gotten hurt. You, you could have died out there. I almost did, I yelled, rocking back and forth on the floor while gripping the coat. The fucking thing chased me for a half a mile. You saw it. It broke the tree line. It's outside the door. It, 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 it was... Evelyn's expression went from angry to just confused and maybe a little hurt. I'd never screamed at her before, not like that. I watched her frown turn deep with concern as she leaned against the window and gently slid down to the floor with her arms crossed. She sat across from me, her anger deflated, replaced with something far more distressed. She shook her head. I, nothing was chasing you, Danny. This is Daniel Esperanza of 104.6 FM. It took a long time, but I think this, this place is finally starting to get into my head.
Sometimes I hated these security cameras. Let me tell you, as soon as we put these suckers up around the watchtower, I have had to see the worst imaginable bullshit day and night. One of the camera points to the long driveway and another one to the shed. Those ones aren't too bad. But the one that points into the woods? Oh, man. That one can just fuck right off. Ugh. I've seen strange figures floating upside down in the woods, mutated animals that shouldn't exist, living plants trying to crawl out of the ground. You know, the other day I saw a deer with its head on backwards staring directly at the camera for like an hour before I started throwing rocks just to chase it away. You know the worst part? It started throwing the rocks back. God, it's just gotten so much worse lately. The day after the fog reached the town, I saw a procession of pale figures wandering blindly through the trees in a straight line. I called the police chief asking what we should do in case these people were still alive, but he said it was too late and I had to let it go. Sometimes the camera picks up another one joining the ghost parade, all heading towards the same direction. But just this once, I was thankful. After all, I wouldn't have noticed that Daniel was running through the woods if not for that view into the trees. It saved us both a bit of time that night. Once I got Dan into the broadcasting room and locked the place up safely, he decided to stay. I tried to get him to let me drive him home, but he said he didn't want to be by himself all night. Well, my shift was almost over anyways. Later that evening, when Finn arrived for his turn in the watchtower, Daniel filled him in on all of the details. You were out there? Up the mountain? At night? Finn didn't even let Dan finish his story before he was already fussing. Ready to hit him with a rolled up newspaper. Buddy. Dan put his hands up defensively. Yes and yes. Okay, I think I was sleepwalking. I I don't know. I, I've never done it before. All I know is that I was in my bed one moment and the next I was standing in the middle of the woods and something was chasing me. Finn was pacing back and forth. I could tell from the frustrated grit of his teeth and the wrinkle between his eyebrows that he was craving a cigarette right now just to get through the stress of having to deal with a couple of dim wits like us. His hair was getting grayer every day. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. This mess is all yours. He pinched the bridge of his crooked, twice-broken nose, letting the stress wash out of him. So you've never really been a sleepwalker? He asked as he sipped from a travel mug. No, never. This is my first time in my whole life. Daniel shrugged. Well, there was this one time when I was a kid, and apparently I took off all my clothes and I crawled on top of the fridge, but I, I didn't remember any of Fenn rolled his eyes and gave an annoyed groan, his shoulders sinking. Dan, enough. We're being serious right now. Did you do anything different yesterday? Take any medication? You drink anything? Be honest. I sat quietly and looked between the two of them while Daniel was visibly scanning through his thoughts for an answer. No. But... I did have a weird dream, he said. Finn watched him silently with an expression as hard as stone. I dreamt that I was floating next to dozens of other people. We were all traveling towards something. A glowing light, sort of pink in color. The others fell into it one by one. When I was the only one left, that's when I woke up. Finn's expression was stern. And hard to read. I imagine that mine was not. That didn't sound good, right? <laughs> and Dan had just told me that one of the creatures from the woods had been trying to lure him in the day before, and now his dreams were doing the same, and the sleepwalking. God, it made me think of her. Jenny. She was a sleepwalker, too. 
Made me think of her stuffed into that tree. Twigs in her mouth. Every bone in her body broken. Dead and cold. Sweet Jesus, I didn't want to find Daniel like that. I remember the last time I saw Jennifer alive. How we fought and said such horrible, mean things to one another. She told me to leave and never come back. I told her I didn't love her anymore. Would my last words to Daniel be just as cruel? Well, we're gonna have to put a shock collar on you so you can't leave your apartment at night. <laughs> I chuckled, pushing down those feelings of guilt and worry. We banished the terrible thoughts with humor, even if it was irresponsible. What if I figure out how to take it off? Daniel challenged. Then we'll put mittens on you. What if I take the mittens off? Oh, fuck, I don't know, man. We'll strap you to your mattress or something. I... And then Finn, without missing a beat, decided to join the conversation. Kinky. He commented with a perfectly straight face. Sipping his coffee again. <laughs> so much for being serious. Daniel was laughing. I was not. Fine. Then I'll glue him to the floor. How's that? My point is... Damn. Damn, my dude. Okay. <laughs> we gotta make sure that you never do this again. Okay. Like, you got really, really, really lucky this time. But next time? I mean, fuck, man. What, what, if, what if they're like... Something happens to you out there. What if we lose you? If if you disappear and we find out and, and, and you're in there ripped in half or, 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 or stuffed in a fucking tree, like... I choked. I didn't want to cry, but there it was. I couldn't help it. I almost lost my best friend again. And even making jokes and teasing one another didn't make it all better. I bit my lip and turned away so the others couldn't see my face. Dan went silent. I imagined all three of us were thinking the same thing. Every year, things got harder and harder and harder for us up here. When would we reach the limit? When would we be just another set of numbers and a list of former emergency broadcasters? All three of us heard a loud, ear-splitting drone. There was a rumble from below us, the stilts of the tower whining and shivering in protest. I braced myself, worried for a second that we were about to topple over before we turned our attention to the front window. A tree had fallen in the woods, and another was starting to lean. It cracked and fell to the ground with another loud boom that shook our little corner of the mountain. We heard that bellow again, followed by the view of giant, twisted antlers peeking above the distant pines, covered in blood. The terrible, unholy screams of creatures that couldn't exist drowned out the chirp of birds and the whistle of the wind as the forest cannibalized itself again, the strongest growing stronger. The beast was hunting again. Closer than usual. <laughs> he was making himself known. I knew it was a sign. The next fog day, he would be waiting. Eager to finish what he'd started and tear the village asunder. We hadn't even finished cleaning up from the last time. It would come for us first. And somewhere deeper in the forest, there was that glow again. Magenta in color, pulsating from somewhere between the trees. Daniel's eyes went wide, the warm color starting to drain from his face. For a moment, he almost looked hypnotized. I think you two should go. Fen clapped a hand down on Dan's shoulder. It was a very very rare moment of gentleness from him? I'll take over. 
I work more on that shed. You two get some rest for your shift. Go, uh, get some late night pancakes or something. I don't know, take a drive, whatever it takes to clear your heads. I'll keep an eye on Rudolph out there so he can't break the tree line on a clear night. Remember that. Fen was right. He always stressed the importance of keeping a cool head around here. Most of the former employees were gone because they had let their fear take hold. It was the death of them, and it would be the death of us too if we didn't keep it together. Dan and I got into my rusty old pickup truck and drove out of town, down the dark, twisting path that circled the mountains. We just needed a breather, an hour away from Pine Haven. Daniel insisted on grabbing his camera and bringing it with him, taking photos of the drive and the Christmas decorations we saw on the way. We stopped for some fast food and decided to eat it in the parking lot while looking out at the quiet streets of a town that wasn't ours. Okay, okay, one more. Daniel pointed at me with a french fry. Uh, repeat after me. Doce de la noche. Du... Duce deli noche. Evelyn, no. Listen. Doce de la noche. Your E is too sharp. Dosi do nacho cheese. Okay, now you're just being a dumbass on purpose. I cackled like a weird little witch as Daniel tossed a crumpled up napkin at the side of my head, watching it bounce off and fall somewhere in between the seats. So, uh, catch me up. Did I miss anything interesting yesterday? He was shoving french fries in his mouth as if he hadn't eaten in days. I shrugged, trying to recall the events of the day. I mean, other than finding you running around in the woods like Sasquatch? Nothing too spectacular? I heard a lot of activity out there, but I didn't really see much. Except some movement on the security cameras. I think there's something new stopping around, but I didn't really get a good look at it. It was, it was fleshy, though. Like, a lot of limbs had a lot of them. A lot of limbs. Daniel shivered. Oh, don't say that. It was just out there. All the more reason to stay in your bed, nerd. I teased him, sipping my drink. Uh-oh. Bartholomew bit me again. Shitty little bastard, man. Look at my finger. Dan inspected the bandage around my middle finger. Oh, you poor sweet baby. He said sarcastically. He wouldn't bite you if you didn't piss at him so much. Oh, I know. Uh... I tossed a french fry at Dan. <laughs> we both laughed. And Daniel threw a fry right back that hit me square in the nose. Great. Now I had a greasy, salty nose and a dirty truck. I can't help it. I live to be a pest. Speaking of pests, though, there's been like a fuck ton of bugs on the windows since yesterday. I counted like 460 wasps before I got bored. Daniel made a small hmm of interest, chewing his burger. I thought all the bugs were supposed to be dead and in hell by now. <laughs> you and me both, I said with a snort. I liked this. We weren't talking about the fog. We weren't talking about what happened last night. I knew it was in Daniel's mind, as it always was, but just this once. I didn't want him to obsess over it. Just this once, I wanted him to eat a fucking burger in peace. Soon after, we went back home and I walked with Dan to his apartment. We talked on our way up the stairs, trying to distract ourselves with holiday decorating plans. I insisted on getting Big Boy's head mounted and putting Christmas lights on it, but Daniel quickly reminded me that even if we could take down the beast, that his head probably wouldn't fit in the tiny building. Then we got to Dan's door. He reached into his bag and pulled down a spare set of keys. Here. Uh, just in case you ever, you know, uh, need to get to my place and I'm not here, or if there's an emergency, or if I go missing, or... Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I interrupted him, taking the keys. I, I think we'll be okay, but, you know, Thanks. We said goodnight and parted ways. And for the first time, 
I was more afraid for my friend out here than I was afraid for the one in the tower tonight. When I fell into bed, I had a dream. It started out as a memory. We were parked at the edge of the woods, my dad and I, sitting in the bed of a pickup truck. I looked over at him. His thick red beard, his suntanned face covered in freckles. He was wearing his coat, orange with uh, you know, yellow stripes. We were watching smoke rise in the distance. Why are you setting fires in the woods? I asked curiously, kicking my little legs back and forth. <laughs> One of my shoes was untied. Won't the animals get hurt? He laughed. It was a deep belly laugh, quiet and low. <laughs> Don't you worry now, Ginger Snap. None of the animals are getting hurt. It's called a controlled burn. We have to do them now and then to get rid of things that are old and dead so they won't cause problems. Hmm. I scrunched my mouth to one side. I assumed he meant dead trees, dead plants. Problems like wildfires? My dad stared out into the trees, slowly nodding. Yeah, baby, like wildfires. He was quiet for a long moment before he looked at me and smiled. Here, I got something for you. He jumped down and started to pull the sleeves of his coat off, a thermal shirt underneath. He handed it to me. It was heavy, smelling like smoke, gasoline, and pine. It's big now, but you'll grow into it, he said. You hold on to that here. One day, it'll be an old antique, and, and it'll remind you of me when you're grown. I was too young to catch the sadness in his voice. That low Virginia drawl laced with years of regret. The finality of it all. I looked down at the coat with a smile, bringing it up to my face and closing my eyes. Thanks, Papa, I said, breathing in the scent of the woods. The fires. I'll take good care of... When I looked up, he wasn't there anymore. An ill wind blew, tickling the back of my neck and rustling the dead autumn leaves on the ground. I was looking into the trees. Miles and miles of untamed wilderness. Smoke rising from its depths. And right there at the tree line where the forest met the empty dirt. A mountain lion stood completely still, watching me from afar. It had a new face, a miserable, painfully twisted human face. When I woke up, I felt a draft. The crack in my window had gotten even bigger and the freezing wind was whistling through it. I sat up quickly, Relieved to see four apartment walls, but I didn't have long to feel that comfortable before I noticed something was in the room with me. The shadow in the corner. It was hunched on all fours, thin and emaciated. It shivered, weak and cold, and I could see the glow of eyes against a face that was obscured by the dark. It wheezed struggling to breathe through old, rotten lungs. Get out! I hissed, my heart racing. I grabbed my pillow and threw it into the corner at its feet. Get out! When I turned on the light, it was gone. He was gone. But was he ever really? Even after he had disappeared, I could still smell the rot in the air. It was a sickening mixture of dead flesh, gasoline, and smoke. And where the vision once stood, I saw a black stain in the carpet that wasn't there before, burning through the fibers. No matter how hard I try, it won't go away. They will never go away. If you're listening to this, 
I need you to understand something. I'm only sharing this dream because I need you to know why I did what I did next. All I could think about was that night after graduation, about how badly I wanted to forget that grotesque, terrible face. Once upon a time, I drank my life away just to forget the look in his eyes as he begged for death. And how he groaned and whined with two separate voices when I wouldn't give it to him. I grabbed the tequila from the kitchen and I drank so much that I made myself sick. Did I enjoy it? <laughs> Fuck no. I hated every second of it and I felt nothing but shame. But it was the only way to finally get myself to fall asleep. I didn't have any dreams for the rest of the night. I mean, sure, I woke up feeling like shit. I knew I would. But for a very brief moment in time, my brain was completely quiet. When morning arrived and I got ready for work, nursing a terrible headache the whole time, Daniel was already waiting at the bottom of the stairwell. You know, to be honest, a part of me was afraid that he wasn't going to be there. But he looked okay. He was freshly bathed, well-rested. He had his shoes on, the right feet, and everything, honestly. I mean, pfft. When I got closer, I realized he had a bow tie with Christmas lights on it. Oh, dear Lord, he was charging up. He was about to change into his most powerful final form. One thing you have to know about Danny... He is absolutely insufferable around the holidays. Hey, Sleeping Beauty. Any impromptu hikes last night? I asked as I met him at the bottom of the stairs. Nope. Slept like a baby. He said proudly, snapping his suspenders. How about you? Did you get some rest, bud? I heaved a big sigh and nodded my head. Yeah, I slept pretty good. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, I think we still got donuts or something at the station. I could go for a donut right now. I could go for several donuts. We took my car to the station, even though it smelled like day-old french fries. When we arrived, we found Finn on a ladder, fiddling with something outside the shed. What's going on? Daniel asked, squinting at a small device stuck to the wall. New security cameras? Yep, Finn said hopping down off the ladder and clapping his hands together. He had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, clenched between his teeth. One on the tree, right over there. Totally busted. Something must have caught on to what it was and destroyed it last night. Found it in pieces, tossed it into the clearing. Like it wanted you to find it, Daniel said softly. His eyes were focused on the tree line, one specific spot in particular to be exact. There was nothing there but the shadows cast by the pines and the glitter of falling snow. I noticed the way his expression turned uneasy, and I gave him a quick pat on the arm. Come on, champ, I said. Let's go inside. Before we could step away, Fen cleared his throat and stepped out in front of me, turning his eyes to Daniel for just a moment. Dan, go on ahead. Evelyn and I need to talk for a second. I noticed the way Dan looked between the two of us, as if wondering if something was wrong. I thought the exact same thing. He didn't argue, though, and moments later he was giving us a quick grin before walking up to the tower alone, looking back only once or twice in suspicion. I folded my arms to fight off the cold, raising my eyebrows at Finn. What do we need to talk about? I asked quietly. If it's about Dan and the fog last weekend, I mean, I, I think he's just feeling a little bit... You're drinking again. Finn's words were blunt. Direct. So sure of himself. He looked down at me with a stern brow and tight lips, his jaw clenched. When I opened my mouth to respond, he put up a single finger to silence me. Ah, ah. Don't you try arguing the, with me this time. Your eyes are bloodshot. You smell... It's below freezing out here, and you're sweating. I can tell when someone's got a hangover, and you 
They've got a hangover, ma'am. I fidgeted nervously on the spot, looking down at the snow as I crossed my arms even tighter. I... I, I had a bad night. You know, I, a, a couple of bad nights. I, I'm over it. I'm over it. Fen took a step forward, his face assertive, but not unkind. He showed his compassion in uh, very harsh ways sometimes, but that straightforward attitude was how I always knew he was looking out for us. Lynn, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. He spoke quietly. Recovery isn't linear. You know that. You've been here before. But you have got to let us help you. And that means taking this seriously and making a real effort. Starting right now. This job takes all of us. I shuffled my feet, hands tucking themselves inside the pockets of my coat. Briefly, I glanced around to make sure that Daniel had gone back into the building. I, um, I, I don't want Dan to know. I admitted. And I won't tell him. Then promised me, standing up straight again. He put a heavy hand on my shoulder. But when you go home, if you got the temptation to drink, I want you to call me instead. I'll talk you through it. Not as an officer, not as a mentor, just as a friend. Got it? Now... I'm heading out, got ranger duty in the woods today, so two of you stay out of trouble. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we will. I drew my coat in closer, turning around. Um, thanks, Ben. Good luck today. Don't need it, he said confidently, flicking his cigarette butt into the woods. Now, go inside and do your job, kiddo. It's cold as a witch's left ass cheek out here. Drink some water for a change, will you? When I got up the stairs, I relayed Fen's message to Daniel, who promptly responded with, Oh, I'm gonna get in so much trouble today. I was glad to see his spirits returning. We put up our coats, did the weather and news broadcast together, and spent the rest of the morning talking about better things. We talked about the holidays, we talked about what ranger duties Finn could have had, and whether or not it included battling animals in, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat. I sketched a little picture of Finn punching an elk in the throat, and we hung it up on the corkboard. Strange, isn't it? This codependent relationship we have with this tower. Everything about Pinehaven sucks, and I hate it, and I wish I could just burn it to the ground, but... When we're up here, we have a purpose. We have something to occupy our minds. Up here, we're important. Around noon, we got a call. I answered it, half expecting it to be someone asking more about the missing people. Instead, all I heard was a high-pitched buzz. I tapped on the headset, thinking maybe it was just a little interference, you know? Hello? I called out. Daniel was looking at me with narrowed eyes, and then glanced at the console to try to see the number. Didn't show up. Rather, it was just seven zeros on the screen. At first, there was silence. Then a quiet croak of breath from an old, dry throat. It was quiet. So quiet, I held the headset closer to my ears. And then the buzzing began again. I tapped the headset again, and immediately felt a sharp sting to the inside of my ear. Jesus Christ, it hurt! With a yelp, I tore the headset off and put a hand up to my ear, feeling something moving and fluttering inside my head. I could feel it in my sinuses, making my eyes water and sting. Dan was already standing up and trying to pull my hands away. What happened? He asked in a panic, surely remembering what happened to him on his first day of work all those years ago. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. There is something inside of my ear. I yelled back, slapping the side of my head to try and dislodge it. Get it out! Get it out! Daniel grabbed my head, 
both hands squishing the sides of my skull to hold me still as he looked inside my ear canal. Okay, okay, I'm looking. Could, could you try to hold still for two seconds, please? I did as I was told. Oh, the feeling of something wiggling down inside my ear was the worst sensation I could possibly describe. Well, maybe second place. It was like an itch I couldn't scratch, chilling my spine and tickling the tubes and cavities I couldn't reach. Just as bad was the feeling of Daniel sticking a finger in the side of my head and digging around trying to grab something. I think... I got it. Daniel exclaimed, quickly pulling something out and cupping it in his hands. I heard the buzz a little weaker now, and that fluttering sensation was gone. All it left behind was a sharp stinging against my tragus. It's... a wasp. Daniel looked between his fingers, getting his eye way too close to the insect for comfort. Oh shit, it's angry. He quickly headed for the fire escape, disabling the alarm and slipping outside to release the insect before it started stinging him too. I followed after him and propped open the fire escape, a hand over my ear as it started to swell. God damn it hurt! Daniel and I watched the wasp fly off, making its way towards the tree line. You know, I should have been a little surprised that he didn't just smash the damn thing and call it a day, but that wasn't what Danny Boy was all about. Even after years of torment in this godforsaken hellhole, he remained one of the gentlest people I'd ever known. I respected him for that. <laughs> he was a better person than I was. I would have squashed the little piss bitch. We stood there on the fire escape for a while. I was looking up at the tops of the mountains, watching the clouds drift slowly behind them. When I glanced at Daniel, he was looking down at the tree line, a sort of constipated look on his face. What now? I asked him, still poking at the sore spot on my ear. Daniel took a shaky breath, tearing his eyes away. I looked at the spot where he'd been staring, but I didn't see anything except for a very subtle shiver in the leaves. Do you see that? He was pointing off into the distance now. I followed his gaze until I saw it too. A cloud of smoke rising out of the forest a couple of miles up the mountain. Despite the snow, a fire was beginning to spread. What do you think the rangers are up to out there? I asked. A strange wave of dread passing through me as I wondered how far that blaze would go and if we'd have to evacuate if it got any closer. I don't know, Dan said. But let's hope they know what they're doing. This is Evelyn McKinnon at 104.6 FM, and I think I'm going to take back what I said about burning this place to the ground. I have so much to say. And the events of the last few days have changed everything we thought we knew about the forest. About what goes on beneath it. <laughs> we thought we understood. I mean, things went into the forest, things died, then they came back as something new, right? I mean, God, I wish it was that simple. Last night, we saw more than just monsters. And while I'm here alone, waiting for Dan to call me from the hospital, I'll write down everything there is to tell. <laughs> everything I can possibly remember. The wind was pushing smoke up the mountainside, creating billowing black clouds that faded into the trees. That fire we'd seen in the early afternoon was still going spreading slowly up the mountain. Daniel and I stood on the fire escape for the longest time and just watched it burn. Slightly anxious, but still mesmerized. Maybe they started it, you know? Like a 
Controlled burn? Daniel pondered as he leaned against the railing. My heart began to sink. They used to do those when I was a kid. My dad told me about it. They stopped after something went wrong? I shrugged, turning around and back towards the building. I don't know. All I know is that I am fucking freezing. I'm going back inside. I'll leave the door propped open for you. I drew my flannel tighter around myself. When I slipped back into the broadcast room, Daniel stayed on the fire escape, just watching. I could tell he was cold by the way he tucked his hands into his sleeves. The deep color of his face flushed as frost nipped at his skin. But his eyes were fixed on the tree line. Not on the smoke, but the tree line. What's wrong, Danny boy? I asked him, sitting back down at my side of the desk. I was busying myself by adjusting the various media cells on my screen, preparing a pre-recorded advertisement for a local antique store's holiday sale. There were less and less ads lately, but with less people sticking around, businesses shutting their doors for good, well, Pinehaven was shrinking. Daniel didn't acknowledge me at first. He just stared at that spot on the tree line, his breath appearing as a small fog before being carried off by the wind. Do you feel like you're being watched? He asked. The question lingered in the air for a moment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, all the time, I said with a light chuckle. Stupid bird out there again? You know, if he's bothering you, I've found that if you just toss kind of like a part of a candy bar at him, he just, he'll dive right for- No. Dan answered quickly. He didn't smile. He didn't laugh. There's something else. It's been following me around for a while now. Watching me whenever I'm here alone. That thing I met when the fog rolled in. Now- I knew that Daniel had been having a tougher time than usual. I mean, that's obvious, right? What happened that night screwed us up badly. And it was going to be impossible to leave behind, but still. Danny had a way of always being the most hopeful, gentlest person at the station. And I could slowly see that exterior start to turn cold. In all these years, he'd stayed optimistic, but I always had that suspicion that maybe that cheerfulness was for us and not for himself. It seemed more apparent than ever. You, uh, want to talk about it, my dude? I asked gently, pulling out his chair and patting the seat to try enticing him over. He looked at me, then at the tree line for a short while then finally decided to enter the building and close the door behind him. Instantly, the room felt warmer. I don't know if I should. He answered as he sat down, kneeling forward with elbows on his knees. I, I just don't want you or Finn to, you know, worry that there's something wrong with me. I don't want it to seem like I'm losing my grip on things. I snorted, hanging up my headset and giving a quick glance at the lineup on the screen. We had time to spare. Bud, the first year we met, you watched me run into the woods, unprepared, willing to fight a goddamn tree to get back a body part that I wouldn't even be able to use. <laughs> You're in good company for that kind of conversation. I just want to help you. Daniel cracked a small smile. It wasn't a happy one. I don't think, just a slightly satisfied one. Of all the people he should expect judgment from, <laughs> I was not that person. He cleared his throat, looking down at the floor, and then he looked at his hands while he picked at one of his fingernails. There's something out there that wears my face, he said. It talks with my voice, it moves like me. When the fog rolled in, I... I went down to get the generator prepared, you know, just in case. It followed me back up and stood outside the door, talking to me, telling me how I should feel about myself. It reminded me of the night you lost your eye and how I did nothing about it, and how I've hated myself ever since. I, 
I, I didn't think I hated myself, but I'm starting to second guess that now. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting all that. What Daniel said alarmed me on several different levels. Not only because the forest had never done that before, but because I... I never knew he still struggled with that night in the forest. I had never asked, and we didn't talk about it. Maybe I'm not the greatest friend after all. Okay, listen up. I sat up straight, giving Daniel a stern look. That night when the chode out there took my eye, it wasn't your fault. Danny, you were in the hospital unconscious for two days after that. It broke your ribs. It almost fractured your spine. It kicked you in the head so hard that we thought you might not wake up ever. I know that you would have done something to help me if you could. I, I knew that from day one. I watched Daniel look towards the wall, the floor, anywhere but me. Doesn't matter. I'm I still screwed everything up then. I screwed it up last week. I'm starting to think I can't do this anymore. I sighed and moved my head into his line of sight, leaning over in my chair. It does matter. Everyone who came before us, they fucked up too. If they, if they didn't, they'd still be here. You and I, Finn, we're still here. So you're doing something right. A thought came into my mind. I always had the impression that Daniel was too good for this place. Too, too good to stay here. Unlike me, <laughs> he had talent and aspirations and charisma. He was a good person. You know, it, if you want to quit, that's okay too, I told him. No one's going to be angry about it. We can still keep in touch. You you can call me anytime. I'll, I'll even come visit when I can. I mean, you don't have to do this anymore. Daniel looked at me in silence for a long moment. The room grew eerily still. The clocks had stopped at some point during our conversation. Even the wind outside the wooden walls decided to calm. With a sigh... Dan took hold of one of my hands. I don't want to leave, he said. I think those dreams and ambitions have changed over time, turned into something new. After everything, I just... I don't think I could go back to a normal life if I tried, you know? And besides, what would you do without me? I smiled and gripped his hand, giving it a strong squeeze. I don't want to find out, Danny boy, I told him. So, if that shithead comes back and tries to mess with you again, just remember that it's just making things up to hurt you. None of it means anything. It's it's just a it's just a dick face, you know? I mean, Dan laughed. Excuse you, that's technically my face you're talking about. Am I a dick face? I wore a stupid shit-eating grin. No, but you are a dick for. What's a Oh, fuck you. What are you, 12 years old? Come on, Lynn. Daniel stopped himself when he noticed the pure evil expression on my face. I let out a cackle and he slapped me on the knee. Hard. I got him laughing. Genuinely, and at long last. Nothing would make it all better. I mean, I knew that, but this dark cloud hanging over us was too heavy to hold all the time. I knew how it felt to drown, and I knew how it felt to need someone to pull you back up when you went under. Dan took a deep breath. I'll be okay, he said, putting his other hand on top of mine. He was still cold from the frozen December air, soaking up the heat of my fingers. I'm not going anywhere. I gave him a direct, serious glare. Will you pinky swear it? Daniel chuckled and bound our little fingers together, squeezing them tightly. Pinky swear. He agreed. Here we were, 
two grown adults making the sacred vow of children. I guess it's true, what they say about being afraid in an unpredictable world. Sometimes you have to return to something that feels safe. I was the first to notice the subtle shake in the floor. The wood around us began to creak, and our desks trembled, the items atop it shifting across the surface. And by the time Daniel realized, he was already holding onto the edge of the table with a white-knuckle grip until the tremors finally stopped. Dust fell from the ceiling above us, and I noticed the smallest crack in the main lookout window. Oh, dear God. I can only hope this rickety old structure was built to last. Another one of those earthquakes. Daniel spoke softly, finally letting go of my hand to go stand beside the window. He was looking out into the forest, where the fire had now subsided. Think this place can hold if they get any worse? The way the wood beneath our feet groaned, and the way the metal of the fire escape twisted and bent, I didn't know how I felt. Mmm, maybe, I shrugged. But maybe we should also start maybe thinking of an escape plan, you know, just in case, you know. The day passed by, slowly and with little incident, aside from a few tame oddities. The sink in the back of the room was clogged, and I found the beginnings of a wasp's nest while attempting to repair it. All of the wasps inside were dead. A while later, the same song played on the radio over and over and over for uh, about two full hours. It was, uh, Something by Jackie Wilson. Eventually we got... Stir crazy? <laughs> so, so much so that Daniel insisted that we get up and dance to it. Now, I usually hate dancing, but halfway through trying to learn how to do the Lindy Hop, I guess it was kind of fun. <laughs> As the day began to grow dark, Daniel and I realized something odd. We hadn't heard from Finn all day. At seven o'clock, right at the time when Finn would have ordinarily been taking over his turn at the controls, we got a call. It wasn't him, and it wasn't our employers at the town hall either. It was the voice of an old woman that I know I'd heard before. Evelyn, dear. She spoke calmly on the other end of the phone. It's been a long time. Hasn't it? I looked at Dan, perplexed, trying desperately to place the voice. We were on the air and I had no choice but to make up an excuse, chuckling weakly and anxiously. <laughs> um, I'm certain it has, ma'am. Now, could you jog my memory <laughs> and let our listeners know who I'm speaking to? <laughs> there was a sigh on the other end. Rose, darling, my name is Rose. It started to come back to me then. Danny's first day on the job, just before he lost his hearing, just before the forest took its first blood sacrifice. Rose was on the phone with us. She she was talking about God. I I thought we blocked that number. Uh, I, I remember, <laughs> I said, trying not to sound shaken. Uh, of course. How are you doing tonight, Rose? What's, uh, what's on your mind? There was a pause, heavy and foreboding. And when the old woman spoke again, she spoke so quietly, and yet with such command. I found myself leaning in closer to listen, holding my headset against one ear. The ground is bursting open, isn't it? We've all felt it, my dear. The great bellow from the deep. I told you it would happen so long ago, and here we are at last, on the eve of a new world. That kingdom in the forest is finally preparing for the arrival of God. You know it to be true, and your friend knows it as well, doesn't he? He's seen it. It gave him deaf ears to better see its glory. It's already called to him. I stared at the console, 
Her phone number wasn't appearing on the screen. There was no number. As I felt my blood pressure rise and I noticed the look of unease painted across Daniel's face, I reached over to turn the recording software off. Gently, I leaned in, dropping my voice down to a whisper. Who are you? Really? I asked in a trembling, weak voice. Rose laughed. It was a quiet, withdrawn laugh hidden behind closed lips. That pleasant, grandmotherly tone of hers no longer instilled false comfort in me. But rather, it seemed more menacing than ever before. But then, the voice changed. It deepened, taking on a different accent, a different tone. I heard the voice of a man, gruff and gentle, at the same time. Hey, don't you worry now, Ginger Snap, the voice said. It'll all make sense to you in time. Hanging up wasn't enough. I tossed my headset, getting it away from me as quickly as I could. My chair toppled back and I got to my feet, getting as far away from the desk as possible. Before I knew it, I was walking backward until I hit the wall. My breath was stolen from me, my heart racing as a chill passed through each and every bone in my body. Daniel was looking at me with concern and heartbreak, but he didn't say anything. He didn't have to ask. I think he knew. The sky had long been dark the early winter sunset leaving us with a cloudy and moonless sky. But somewhere, out above the pines, we saw a brand new light. It was a sudden shock of red that rose into the air, exploding in a shower of flame. It's a flare. Daniel turned to the window, the shimmering light reflecting in his eyes. Someone's in trouble out there. I joined him at the window, watching the ball of light glimmer above the tallest trees. I realized something then, something I should have known long ago. The rangers had entered that forest that very morning, but we never saw them come back out. Finn was supposed to be here by now, I said shakily. He's late. How many times has Finn ever been late? Daniel's face went blank. Never, he said already on his way across the room. He found the cabinet of Finn's emergency supplies, already strapping a first aid kit to his belt by the time I dialed our police station. And for the first time ever, no one picked up. The line was busy. All the lines were busy. Something was happening, either out in the woods or in the town, and it was so much bigger than us. I tried calling again, but no answer. And the last thing I wanted to do was go out there, braving the woods once again and risking losing life and limb. Uh, we'd already done it before. More than once. And it never ended well for us, did it? But I remembered the night I lost my eye, and who had carried me back to town. We weren't even friends yet, and Finn still saved us both that night never even asking for a thank you. And then, that prick had the audacity to stick around? Oh! Give me the shotgun, I pointed at the cabinet, snapping my fingers. Daniel gave me a squinty-eyed look and just kept shoving shit in a backpack. Come on, come on, come on, come on! Drop, 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 do it! That. Give me the shotgun! Let's go! Lynn, you've never even held the shotgun. Start with something more your size. I marched over to the cabinet and grabbed the weapon myself. I don't want something smaller. I want the shotgun. I scowled at him and he just smirked and shook his head. Don't you laugh at me. I'm not laughing at you. Daniel commented, closing the cabinet and strapping the backpack to himself one shoulder at a time. I'm just laughing at how some things change, but... Other things don't. Yeah, at the time, I have to admit, 
I didn't know what he meant by some things change, but looking back, I think I get it now. I'm remembering the day we first met, when Daniel introduced himself to me, and I was certain that I would absolutely hate him. Oil and water. We'd never get along. None of it would work. And here we were, years later, ready to go into the woods and die side by side for a friend. Before Daniel and Finn, I always thought that Jennifer would be the only true special person that I would have ever have had in my life. My, um, my soulmate. <laughs> I hung on to that idea for a long time. Even after she chose Elijah instead of me. Even after she died. <sighs> Maybe it's time for me to let her go. <sighs> Maybe she's finally ready to rest. Daniel and I put on our coats, strapped on packs and ammunition, and rushed down the metal staircase just as we did all those years ago. The well, last time it was a fool's errand. A mistake. This time, it was a rescue mission. <laughs> it was still a stupid idea, sure, but I, I don't think we'd be able to forgive ourselves if we didn't try. And the flare was still in the sky, straight ahead and half a mile up the mountain. As we approached the tree line, I noticed Daniel stop, his eyes fixed towards something unseen between the pines. I followed his gaze and saw nothing but the gentle fall of snow. Still, I didn't need to see it to know what it was. Hey, man. I grabbed his hand, squeezing it tightly. Don't look at it. Don't think about it. It can't hurt you if you don't let it. Was that true? I didn't know. I was making a wild guess, and, well, I suppose it worked, because moments later, Daniel had torn his eyes away from the tree line and was the first to step into the forest without looking back even once. He pulled me along by the hand as the light of the radio tower disappeared behind the bare, frozen trees. I don't know how long we walked. It felt safer, not being alone, but that uneasy feeling of being watched never left. Every hoot of an owl in the trees, every rustle of branches, every squeak of a small animal felt like the spies of the forest were watching our every move. And even when nothing was there, we felt hunted. The feeling only grew stronger when we found huge, sunken holes in the ground. At a certain point, the damage from the earthquakes could be seen. Trees were sinking into the soil, deep cracks were forming between the lines, and some of them were leaning to one side, but it wasn't until we'd ventured further than ever before that we noticed tunnels breaking through the surface of the land. Must have been a cave into the mines, Daniel said quietly, crouching down at the edge of a steep fall. Down below, we could see the gnarled system of roots reaching deep down into a dark cave that could have gone on for miles. A horrible, rotten stench was coming up from the tunnel. I remembered the last time we'd fallen into the mines. I don't want to think of what we would find down there now. Mm, I don't like it, I told Dan, tugging on the back of his coat. Let's find another way around. I really don't want you falling in there. Daniel stood up carefully, watching his step as he backed away from the edge. We only got a few steps away when the ground began to tremble beneath us. Subtly, at first. Shit, shit! I hissed under my breath. We both stumbled back, Daniel pulling on my arm as we made a quick escape from the crumbling ground. The quake took more of the forest down into the cavern with a loud rumble. A tall, old pine began to creak and snap at the base of its trunk as it fell, crashing down into the pit on a bed of frozen dirt and snow. We didn't fall in this time, but it was a close call. And it was very, very loud. Ooh, something probably heard that, I said, not even bothering to brush the dirt and dust off of myself as I began marching forward. We made a huge circle around the damage so as not to tempt a second cheeky little mudslide. We have to find Fen quick and get the hell out of here. 
I am tired of playing these stupid games with... I went quiet. We both stopped walking, standing perfectly still, and just listening. Daniel looked at me perplexed. He didn't hear anything, but I did. Something was moving underneath us. Something big and quick. I could feel the vibration in the ground as it dug its way through the tunnels, coming to investigate the sound. I I turned to Dan and put a finger to my lips, walking slower and with more care than ever before. My heart was racing. It was hard to breathe. Below us, something released a muffled but bone-chilling roar, causing us both to stop dead in our tracks. Stand still. Daniel signed with his hands, slowly and precisely. Wait. We waited, hardly moving a muscle. The quakes in the ground traveled from one side to the other, as if the beast below was patrolling back and forth, over and over. Finally, those vibrations in the ground began to move away. It lost our trail and was moving back into the depths of the mountainside. It's gone. I signed back with my hands. At least for now. We walked another hour, at least, feeling the air grow tighter as we crept further up the mountainside. The signal came from somewhere nearby. Now, it was just a matter of hoping and praying that whoever held that flare gun was still alive and waiting for help. The pines grew taller and older the further we went. I'd never seen trees this big before. They eclipsed the moonlight above us, blocking out the sky and the stars until we were left in a cold, black void. The smell was the first thing that led us on the right path. When we broke into a large clearing, we found a pile of dead trees, bones, and burnt flesh stacked up in the snow. Jesus, the stench was overwhelming. So bad that even from several feet away, we were both pulling our coats over our mouths and noses to keep from being sick. It was the same horrible smell I remembered from the tunnels. Only a hundred times worse. It's still smoking, Dan said, taking a sharp breath. He regretted it immediately after, as he turned away with his hand over his mouth. (coughs) God, I... I think I'm going to be sick. As Daniel hunched near the bushes, trying to keep his last meal down, I dared to creep slightly closer to the burn pile. It was a disgusting collection of remains. Charred bones of animals and people, some of them fused together as if they'd melted into one body. Some still had flesh attached to the bones, faces stuck in eternal screams. Others were... moving trying to escape but too weak or too broken to move anything but their fingers and jaws. I was so distracted by the burn pile that I didn't notice what else circled the clearing. Fresh, blood-soaked bodies hanging from the trees above our heads, dripping into the snow. I choked back a scream and stepped away just as Daniel finally found the strength to look up. We were both staring up at them. At least a dozen corpses that had been ripped to pieces. Their remaining parts suspended by vines and gently swaying in the wind. They were hanging around us in a circle like some sick arrangement. Like an art project or fresh game left out to drain. They were all wearing the same uniform. This is Evelyn McKinnon at 104.6 FM, and and I just need a moment to catch my breath.
The freezing air around us was thick with the scent of death. Surrounded by a ring of hanging bodies, I could hear the whistle of wind and the creak of tree branches as they struggled to hold the weight of the swaying corpses. Their faces, some fixed on a permanent scream of terror, shined in the glow of my flashlight with a milk-white stare. <sighs> we couldn't save the rangers. We couldn't save our friend. Something got them. All, all of them. Daniel whimpered quietly. In the moonlight, I could see his dark eyes welling up with tears as we both realized the horrible truth. We were too late. My chest was tight, filled with a mixture of despair and pure rage. Even after our best attempts, we didn't do enough. The blood was still fresh, dripping into the snow. If we had been just a, a little bit quicker than maybe... I grabbed my backpack, holding it tightly in both hands, and threw it down into the snow with a frustrated yell. Furious, I stomped back and forth with tears running down my face until I couldn't hold the anger in anymore. I kicked the pack at my feet again and again, picking it up and tossing it away from me just to have something to hit. Daniel tried his best to calm me down, attempting to put his arms around me, but I only pushed him away. I didn't want to hug. I wanted to fucking shoot something. As I tried to hold back the urge to scream, Daniel brought up something even more sickening. Even more sad. Which, which one's Finn? He asked. He sniffled, wiping his nose on his sleeve. We can't leave him here. I, I, I want to see him become one of those things. His, his family should be able to bury him, don't you think? I paused, letting out a shaking breath, and watching it form a cloud of fog in the cold air. He was right. Of all the people lost to this godforsaken chunk of land, Finn didn't deserve to be stuck here forever. Like Jenny. Like Dad. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look. I'll look on this side, I said, wiping my face. I marched around the clearing, shining my light up at the stinking corpses that surrounded us. Some were impossible to recognize, their faces mangled or heads completely removed. Others still wore expressions of terror, frozen in time. But none of them, neither in face or in body, reminded me of him. Daniel must have noticed the same thing. I don't see him. He said shakily, stepping around the burn pile. Maybe he's not here. Maybe he ran. Maybe. I whispered, too quiet for Dan to hear. Maybe not. The ground was loose at the edge of the tree line. I could see the bend in the pines as they began to sink into the ground, dipping into another one of those holes that the tunnel system beneath the forest floor was making. I shined my light downward following the debris from a recent cave-in. I saw something down there. A pair of dirty black boots. They were connected to a body, sitting slumped against the roots and half hidden by the shadow of the cave's entrance. The body was shivering, breathing, alive. A very quiet voice was calling my name, struggling to speak louder than a whisper. Finn? I called out, beginning to climb down the fallen logs and roots that formed a slope into the tunnel. I, I caught a bit of wet mud, my foot slipping. Oh shit. Finn, it's us. We're here. We, we saw your signal. I heard a cough from down below and a shaky, wheezing breath. As I approached, I shined my light on Finn's face. Dear Lord, 
He was burned. One half of his jaw, neck, and his shoulder had melted away, all the way down to the elbow. The skin was bloody and twisted, steam still rising from his wounds. He was recognizable. Still had both eyes, a nose, most of his lips. But I could hardly imagine how much it must have hurt. He looked at me, blinking wearily and forcing a tiny smirk on the one unaffected side of his face. <laughs> took, took you long enough. <laughs> he forced the words out, slowly extending his uninjured arm so that I could help him stand. It took a couple tries, but finally he got to his feet, shivering and curling his half-burned arm up against his chest. Every move he made was tender and careful. I went ahead of him, stepping onto the dirt piles and roots so that I could help drag him up with me. Daniel was already reaching into his pack to grab a length of rope, tossing it down so that I could tie it around Finn's waist and keep him steady. Between the two of us, we managed to get him up to the surface, where he staggered and pressed his back into the trunk of a tree. Take a break. Daniel told him softly, searching my pack for bandages. Wouldn't do much, but we could at least cover the worst of the burns. His hands were shaking the whole time. He never was very good around blood. Shit, man, what the hell happened to you? Ben was still catching his breath, voice dry and pained. I handed him a bottle of water and then opened it up for him after he struggled to get the cap off. He took a small sip, hissing in pain and putting his hand up to his neck to touch the raw, burned muscle. We, we, we managed to capture a dozen of them. Maybe more. Figured the only way to get rid of them for good was to burn them. So we made a pile. He looked over at the stinking mass of dead, charred flesh while Dan got busy wrapping up his arm. Something else found us, though. It was huge. Not, not the elk. Something else. Something new. Ugh. It came from underground. My heart sank, my stomach churning with a wave of nausea. That thing I heard below us, those heavy motions in the earth as we circled the cave in, Whatever killed the rangers was right below us that whole time, and Daniel and I never even knew. It killed them, one by one. Then continued, trembling like a leaf in the wind. It, it ate some parts, threw some in the fire, tossed me in two. I, I doused m myself in the s snow uh, and managed to hide, but the others didn't make it. No one made it. We all went silent. The three of us. Then, Daniel asked a question that was on both of our minds. Only, I was too scared to ask. What was... it? Finn's eyes were wide and fearful, reflecting the moon's light. He swallowed speaking up in a hoarse whisper. Something we've been studying for a while now. They've been calling it the Hydra. If you saw it, you'd know why. A chill ran up my spine, separate from the winter cold. I put a hand on Finn's good arm and pulled him away from the tree, gently coaxing him to follow. Let's hope we don't see it then. Come on, we have to get out of here. Something's gonna smell all this blood. Finn, can you walk? Our friend was staggering clumsily along, but he nodded his head once he got his feet under him and began to march beside me. Yeah, I, I think so. We followed the direction of Finn's compass, taking a route different from the one that had brought us here. If there was anything we'd learned during our time in the forest, it was not to tempt anything that may have already been tracking our steps. But as the night grew darker and the trees grew thicker, we noticed something that wasn't there before. A light 
ahead of us, emanating from the ground in a giant, pulsating glow, was that magenta-colored light we had all seen from a distance. Only now, we were close enough to hear the ear-stinging hum that it made. It was like a low drone or the sound of an undersea giant, deep but steady. We were all silent as he walked towards it, feeling some magnetism that I still can't quite explain. It didn't take long before we figured out where the light was coming from. The trees began to thin. Soil began to crack. Ahead of us was an enormous split in the earth, forming a pit that went on and on and on. The glow was coming from its depths, so far down into the earth that we couldn't see the bottom. An old memory came back to me then. A phone call Daniel and I had listened to years ago. I still remembered the way she said it. The exact words she used. I had a dream in which the forest split in two. I whispered Rose's immortal words out into the cold night air. Daniel and I exchanged glances. Something more than fear between us. It was dread. The real, tangible dread of something utterly unknown. We both remembered the rest of the old woman's dream. It covered everything. Daniel repeated. The town and the sun, all that my eyes could see and the sound it made. A fearsome bellow that shook the whole earth. Hey, Danny boy, I asked softly. Do you think God lives in the woods? The three of us stood there in silence, looking at one another and then into the enormous pit that was swallowing the forest. All of these quakes, all of these storms, it was getting bigger every day. Something was down there. Something that had been waiting for the right time to emerge. I feel as if that time is coming. And when it happens, I... I, I don't know what we'll do. Fen and I managed to break our eyes away from the glow, but Daniel did not. I could see it cast a pink light on his face, as if the black of his eyes were beginning to change colors, shining on their own. He was staring, unblinking, into the endlessness. And as he started to lean, as if ready to let himself fall in, Finn and I both rushed to push him back and into the snow. He fell on his back, stiff as a board, eyes still glazed over with an ice cold expression. I pinned him down with one of my knees, snapping my fingers in his face. Dan! 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 I hissed, tapping him on the cheek until he finally blinked and took a sharp inhale of breath. Come on! Wake up! He blinked and looked up at me finally, confused and lost. His eyes darted around the forest as if those memories were flooding back to him, reminding him of where he was and how he got here. It took a moment before his breathing settled and he began to touch his own face, making sure he was inside of his own body. I think we should go. He said shakily. Now that, that was an idea I could get behind. I let him up, slowly helping him to his feet and brushing the snow off his shoulders. Fen and I looked at one another, making the silent agreement that linking our arms would be the best possible way to stick together. We walked, and we walked, and we walked. Our pace was slow, keeping up with Finn's exhausted and injured body. And at first we were lucky. We didn't see much in our path other than a few small, timid creatures and more evidence of the collapsing ground. Our luck had to run out eventually. When the moon was high above us and the forest grew eerily silent, we felt that rumble in the ground again. Only it wasn't a quake. It didn't shake the trees. It didn't split the ground. 
It was just movement, tunneling beneath us in a straight line through this frozen, solid soil. Finn's bloodied face became paler, wet with fever as his eyes turned startlingly wide. He knew that tremble in the ground. We all did. Something was moving under our feet. Something had been following us. Move, Finn said, voice shaking. He pushed me in the back to hurry me along. Stay quiet. Move fast. But not too fast. Watch your feet. My hands were gripping the shotgun tightly as I marched forward. My jaw clenched, an eye fixed on the trees ahead of me. My breathing was shallow, my heart racing. Under our feet, we felt the rumble weaving back and forth, back and forth, as if a great beast was patrolling the caverns. I couldn't tell if it was looking for us or if it had already found us and was just toying with our minds before making a move. All I knew was that I'd never seen Finn so scared. And if he was scared, <laughs> Dan and I sure as hell should be terrified. We saw more holes in the ground, more open caverns where the forest split open. There was no telling how far these tunnels went, or how many there were snaking through the ground beneath our feet. Uh, for all we knew, this thing could have burrowed its way through every inch of land between here and Pinehaven. I hated that idea. I hated the idea that there was this new way for an amalgamite beast of the woods to get to us. The ground rumbled again, more violently than before. I grabbed onto a tree for support while Finn stumbled and fell over, his hands in the snow. He was looking down, feeling the tremble in the earth through his palms. We all heard it. The shriek of many voices, human and animal, muffled through a layer of soil. It was angry. Finn looked up at both of us, his face pale. In the dark, his lips formed a single word. Run. Daniel grabbed his arm and pulled him up in one swift motion, both of them staggering before getting to their feet again. The three of us abandoned all subtlety and began to race through the trees, my shotgun in hand the whole time. Every few steps it seemed as though we were faltered by another quake in the ground. Something was right below us, trying to dig its way through. Its screams were blood-curdling, like the tormented yell of human voices mixed with the howl of wolves and the deep bellow of a cow. I didn't want to know what kind of a vision went with that sound. To my right, I could see a mound of dirt and leaning trees, another hole in the earth. And from its depth, I saw the brief hint of rotten, fleshy limbs trying to claw their way out. Something was coming out of the ground. Something huge. I felt Daniel's hand grip my arm as he pulled me away from the shifting earth. The screams got louder, more furious, as something heavy fell into the snow and began to run behind us with the footfalls of over a dozen different limbs. I made the mistake of looking back at the Hydra only once. It was a horrendous mass of dead flesh piled up on top of a blob-like body with hooves, arms, and legs sticking out in each direction as if they'd been melted together. It was covered in veins, postules, and gaping mouths full of human and animal teeth. All were dripping with bits of flesh and blood from its recent meal. Atop the body were human torsos, stacked with one coming out of the other in a tall spire that reached up into the trees like branches. They were all screaming, mouths impossibly wide, ghostly white eyes shining in the darkness, arms flailing. I think I recognize some of them. 
those missing people. The ones who floated into the woods when the fog rolled in. Oh, dear God. They'd all fuse together like some sort of grotesque centipede. Big boy was bad to look at, sure. But a flesh centipede? <laughs> I had decided right then and there that flesh centipede, holy shit, was way fucking worse. Don't look, just go. Finn was screaming, noticing the way my fear distracted me. He wasn't faring much better, however, holding his arm up to his chest as he struggled to keep running. I watched his feet falter. He was stumbling, falling to his knees, and failing to get himself back up. Daniel let go of my arm and ran back, pulling Finn back up to his feet. The Hydra was gaining on us, its many legs pushing it along and breaking trees that were in its way. It snapped them like toothpicks. I stopped and took up my shotgun, pointing it at one of the torsos near the top. A single shot rang out, hitting dead flesh with a disgusting burst of dark, rotten blood. But the beast didn't even slow. Up! Get up! I screamed, trying to help Dan get Finn to his feet. We had come all this way out for him. I was not going to just leave his ass behind. But the new amalgamite was gaining. I, I had to do something, and it had to be done real fucking quick. And then I remembered what the rangers were coming out to do. To set the beasts on fire. Finn! Finn, where's your flare gun? I yelled in a panic. I, I, I don't know, I think... Finn, where the fuck is it? It's in my back. <laughs> Left side. I didn't think. I just moved. I tore the pack off Finn's shoulder and dug through it as quickly as I could, pulling out the flare gun and pointing it up at the beast. I didn't know if this would work. I didn't know if it would hurt it or, or just make it angry, but we were about to die if we didn't buy just a few more seconds. I shot at the base of its body. An explosion of red and gold light hitting at full force and igniting the cold, dead flesh. Those legs stopped moving, flailing in an attempt to put out the flame. The shriek it made was ear-shattering and sickening to hear. We left the pack behind. It didn't matter anymore. Once Fen was on his feet, the three of us just ran as far away as we could get leaving the beast and the flames behind. He was running again, stomping through the trees with more fury than ever before. But we had a chance. We could see the tower now, motivated by pure terror and adrenaline while those pounding footsteps grew louder behind us. We finally broke the tree line and fell into the snow one after another into a pile of exhausted bodies. I looked back just in time to see the Hydra stop at the tree line, pushed back as if hitting an invisible wall. It shrieked and roared from every mouth, reaching its arms out to grab us. We were just far enough away to avoid its grasp. Somehow, even with the reliability of the radio signal to protect us, I didn't feel very safe. We filed into the building as quickly as we could, making distance between ourselves and that creature. When we got upstairs, I did the only thing that felt right. I hit the bell, sounding out a painful frequency that made the grotesque monster curl its limbs in agony before retreating to the woods to find a hole to crawl back into. Within minutes, it was gone no doubt returning to the bodies it had been saving for later. I had a feeling that the next time we saw it, the Hydra would be gaining a few more heads. Oh, what in the fuck was that? I yelled. The Hydra, Fen answered, sitting on the floor and holding a hand against his bleeding face. We've been watching it for a while now. It's... <laughs> Not that! I laughed hysterically, pacing back and forth. <laughs> that big fucking hole in the ground? 
Where did that come from? How long has that been here? What'd you be? Ben just shook his head. I could tell he was just as perplexed as I was. Wishing he knew. Monsters! Ah, monsters we can handle! <laughs> Weird, surreal bullshit in the radio station? Yeah, we can handle. But a goddamn glowing hole in the center of the earth? Ho <laughs> ho! I had no idea where to even start with that. No. That's the same glow. Daniel said softly, leaning against the wall and trying to catch his breath. The one I keep seeing when I sleepwalk at night. The one we're all walking towards, me and the others. I recalled the look on Dan's face when he saw the pit for the first time. Mesmerized. Entranced. He was ready to fall in. Whatever was calling him to the woods, along with those other missing people from the village, it was down there. <laughs> was it going to swallow us all? You're hurt. I gestured to Daniel's hand, where a trail of blood was dripping through his fingers. He rolled his sleeve up gingerly, revealing a long gash he'd gotten while running through the trees. Shit. He sighed. It's fine, I got bandages. He was rooting around in his first aid kit by the time that I'd crossed the room, pulling out my car keys and dropping them into his palm. You and Fen both need to go get checked out. There's a hospital an hour or so out of town. You know the one. I curled his fingers in, closing his fist. Take my truck. Get Fen to the ER. I'll watch the tree line tonight. Dan looked at me for a long, hesitant moment. Then... His eyes left my face to peer out the window, looking into the dark, snowy sky. It was quiet out there. But just because it was quiet didn't mean something wasn't watching us, waiting for another chance. Are you sure you'll be okay here by yourself? He asked. Yes, I nodded, already pushing him toward the door. Now go, both of you. Finn's burns could get infected if you wait. Our ranger friend was already on his way down the stairs, grumbling quietly at me. Dan glanced back at him, then at me, that worrisome look in his eyes again. It'll be fine, Dan. It won't come back tonight. I seemed to convince him, even if his expression lacked confidence. We both knew someone had to stay. He took a deep breath, then wrapped me up in a tight hug and let the air out of his lungs. Be safe. He said letting me go at last. Keep the doors locked, keep your phone with you, and- And keep the radio on. Get on of here, Danny boy. One last second of hesitation, and both of them were gone. I watched Daniel help Finn into the truck, closing the door behind him and looking up at the watchtower one last time before driving away. I gave him a little wave as they went, and the lights of the vehicle disappearing down the dark and lonely road. The snow was falling even heavier now. The lights of the village looked dim and far away, hidden behind a layer of frost spreading across the lookout window. I could feel a draft from the crack in the glass. The first sign that our only safe haven was beginning to crumble. It was deep into the night. The new amalgamate from the woods had been silent ever since, only a subtle rumble in the ground signifying its movements beneath the tree line. I think it's stalking the tower, going back and forth through the tunnels, looking for a way to pass the boundary. Maybe that's what those earthquakes were all along. But the most upsetting thing is the line of alcohol bottles stacked up in the kitchenette. I don't know when they got there, but every time I pour one down the drain, two more appear in its place, like the heads of a hydra. This is Evelyn McKinnon at 104.6 FM, and I don't think I like being alone here anymore.
It's been a while since I've heard the beeps of a heart monitor or the rush steps of hospital staff. The last time I was here, I was the one in the bed, waking up after two hours of a concussion, broken ribs, and a back injury that never really got better. Evelyn was sitting next to me with a hole in her head where her eye used to be. That entire night's been burned into my brain ever since. It's like a bad dream that comes back to haunt me every once in a while. It was my turn to sit by the bedside now. Finn was okay. I mean, I mean, as okay as one could be after getting third-degree burns. He can't use his left arm for a while, but at the end of the day, he didn't lose more than a few patches of skin and a feeling on his left side. Once the pain medicine kicked in, he spent most of his time complaining that his facial hair would never grow in right, and wondering if this would finally kick his smoking habit. I wish I had his strength, you know? His ability to look fear in the eye and decide that he's stronger than whatever brings him down. It's really something. Meanwhile, I'm still having nightmares about something that happened years ago. They said they'd keep Finn overnight and then probably release him in the morning, with a strict regiment of keeping his bandages clean. I was surprised they'd let him out so soon, but looking around I can see why. The hospital was far busier than I'd ever expected. The emergency room was filled to the brim, people coming in with all sorts of freak injuries from the earthquakes, snowstorms. These weren't all people from Pinehaven either, people from the other side of the mountain. They were all whispering, mentioning strange lights, holes in the dirt weird new folk showing up in town. I hate to admit it, but our problem was beginning to spread. I sat there, scrolling through my phone, checking my messages every few moments. Nothing. Starting to get worried. Finn grunted as he adjusted the pillow, giving a long sigh when he finally leaned back again. Expecting a phone call? He asked. I looked up, stammering quietly. Uh, n no, not really. I answered. Just hoping things back in town are okay. Finn gave a soft laugh. If they weren't okay, I'm sure would know by now. He winced a little. He took a deep breath, rolling that burned shoulder. Lynn knows what she's doing. She's got her big girl pants on. If something goes wrong, she knows who to call. Give your blood pressure a break, bud. You make me anxious just looking at you. I snorted under my breath. He was right. Offering one last glance at the phone, I finally let the screen go black, stuffing it back in my coat pocket with the sound all the way up just in case. For a brief moment, I let my eyes wander to the window where the snow was falling heavier now, covering the roads and obscuring the lights of distant traffic. You know... Finn started. I've been meaning to apologize. I know that I keep a lot of things from the two of you. Things that would, uh, would have been helpful to know a lot earlier. About the forest. What we do out there. It was wrong to keep it a secret. I turned back to Finn and moved my chair a little closer to his bedside, dropping my voice. Nothing's stopping you from catching me up to speed now, though, no, right? Finn wore a tired smirk, rolled his eyes. Can't get nothing past you. He commented with a chuckle. For a long moment, he was silent, looking out the window at the snow and the distant trees. People know it's not really a secret anymore, not since the day the fog rolled in. But people have been seeing experiencing. It's getting smarter every day, we think. That's why we're trying to burn the bodies. So they can't keep multiplying. You saw how well that worked out. The entire time he spoke, I'd been wringing my hands and letting one of my legs bounce anxiously. I didn't like any of this. The idea the forest was starting to learn ways around our tricks was a terrifying thought. Brought up the question of what we should do if all of our usual methods stopped working. Has this happened before? I asked. The forest. Has it outsmarted us in the past? Finn nodded his head slowly, eyebrows cinched together in pain when he moved his neck. Yeah, yeah, it, it has, he said. The bell used to be an actual bell, 
You know that, right? Right. They didn't like the sound. It didn't take long for him to figure out that bringing down the bell tower would make it go away. Foggy weather came around, the whole operation would go under, military would get involved, folks from old Pinehaven. They rebuilt and rebuilt dozens of times before the radio tower went up in the 80s. Finally brought some stability. My pulse quickened when I thought about the earthquakes. Those shakes on the ground underneath the watchtower. He was starting to lean more and more every day. When there was the night of the fog, the night my doppelganger almost lured me away, leaving the station without an operator. You think the forest is going to try again? I asked with a sick feeling in my stomach. To bring down the tower. Finn wasn't looking at me anymore. He was staring out the window, watching as the frost covered the glass and turned the night sky into a hazy gray. I think it already is, he said simply. We didn't say much for a long while after that. Finn looked into the snowy horizon. I looked down at my shoes, and we just sat there in silence. Together, but miles apart. Then he spoke again. Stephen, he said quietly. Hmm? My first name. Stephen. I couldn't help but chuckle. So many years of mystery solved, and so simply. Nice to finally meet you, Stephen. Mind if I keep calling you Finn? I'd prefer it, actually. Full name never really suited me. He wore a tiny grin, finally looking over at me. You should go home, buddy. You look tired. I cleared my throat and straightened up my chair, hands on my knees, just trying not to slump over. I'm fine, really. I can stay until they... Shut your mouth, Esperanza. Finn chuckled weakly. Go home. Clean up. Sleep in your own bed. I let you both know when they said I can leave. Don't worry. I'm safer here than either of you. It was like a vacation for me. I wasn't going to argue with him. The dawn was on its way, the dark sky about to welcome the sunrise in an hour or so. Going home to my apartment, being closer to the tower, was awfully tempting. Funny how, even when we were far away from that place, it draws us back in one way or another, like a toxic friend, one we couldn't live without. Fine, but call if you want us to bring you anything, or if there's an update about your go-home, Dan. He waved me towards the door, annoyed. But before I left, I stopped in my tracks one last time, squinted at him from the other side of the room. Are you sure you don't want- I said go home, Dan. The drive home was quiet at first. The road empty. There was no moon in the sky, no stars to light the way, only the dull yellow glow of the truck's headlights on the snowy pavement. As I drove around the winding mountain path, I, I tried to keep my eyes away from the tree line. Every time I glanced to my side, I thought I saw a shadow between the trees, keeping up with the speed of the vehicle, no matter how fast I went. It was better to simply not look. The snow was falling heavy now. It created a white vortex out in front of me, slick pavement underneath the tires of Flint's truck. I tried so hard to keep my gaze fixed in front of me at all times, watching the curve of the road, but something caught my eye. That magenta light. It was shining above the trees now, shining into the sky like, like a beam that went straight upwards. I only glanced at it for a split second and then something darted in front of the truck quick as lightning. I slammed on the brakes. The rubber squealed on the wet road as I began to spin out of control. My heart was pounding. A yell stuck in the back of my throat as I braced myself for a steep fall off the mountainside. It didn't come. The truck stopped just short of the edge, one of the tires hitting a pile of rocks and forcing my head forward into the steering wheel. My ear was ringing. My head was aching. The radio station was just static. After I caught my breath, I stepped out of the car on legs that felt like jello, 
Shivering from a mixture of anxiety and the cold air, I walked out into the road and squinted my eyes in the darkness, expecting to see some startled traveler or injured animal staggering away. At first, I didn't see anything. No animals, no people. And then... Then I heard a rustle in the bushes. At the tree line, a dark figure stood silently, just watching me from afar with brilliant white eyes. The moment turned my head. It began to walk back into the woods, disappearing between the pines until I was alone on that cold, snowy mountain once more. I guess he wasn't really gone after all. When I got to my apartment, I got rid of my shoes and my hearing aid, and I let myself rest in the comfortable quiet of a lonely room. I checked my phone one last time. Nothing. I texted Evelyn a message. I'm home now. Finn is okay. Do you need me to come up there? It took a while, but she messaged back eventually, simply saying, I'm fine. Get some sleep. In hindsight, that message should have been my first hint that something was wrong. It wasn't like Lynn to not have at least one outrageous thing to say. I had that dream again. The one with the procession of shadows and the light coming from the ground. But now I'm sure you could tell how it ended. I was still drifting towards the light from a distance when suddenly my body stopped. Something was holding me back. I thought I thought I could hear the distant hint of a voice, but it was far away, muffled. It wasn't until I felt hands grab my shoulder that I began to fall out of the dream and back into my own freezing, cold, solid body. My eyes flew open. I was standing out in the street, barefoot, dressed in a pair of pajama pants and no shirt. The snow went up to my ankles. I was shivering from head to toe. An older man was shaking me by the shoulder, snapping his fingers in my face to get my attention. Son, ain't you freezing? His voice sounded far away, but I could read his lips. You hearing me, son? I nodded my head, brain still catching up as I looked around at the cold, white world that surrounded me. The old man just shook his head and kept walking, too impatient, too tired to deal with the problems from some strange, half-naked man wandering around in the snow. The walk home was humiliating, but not nearly as upsetting as the thought sitting in the back of my head. What would happen if I reached my destination? What would happen if there wasn't someone to stop me from falling in? The sky was cloudy, the streets quiet. People were leaving, more and more of them moving away every day since the fog invaded the village. I got home, cleaned myself up, and checked my phone. Finding just one message waiting for me. It was Finn. Is Lynn okay? She isn't responding. She didn't respond to me either. I called her once while brushing my teeth, then again as I shoved a pair of winter boots on. In both instances, she didn't pick up. I made one final attempt to call the radio station main line, hoping to catch her on the air, but it continued to ring, completely ignored. I didn't waste any time getting to the radio station, squealing into the long gravel drive and parking right outside the fire escape. When I raced up the stairs and threw open the door, I found the station utterly and completely empty. The radio was playing, the lineup was set, but Evelyn was not there. Her coat and hat were both gone, her bag missing, her headset sitting on the desk abandoned. I rushed to the lockout window, hoping to see a glimpse of red hair or a plaid jacket somewhere out in the clearing. Maybe she was in the shed, fiddling with the security cameras, harassing that damn bird again. I didn't see anything except for that pulsating magenta light still shooting up into the sky. It was stronger now than it had ever been, like a, like a beacon. The shotgun was back in the cabinet. I grabbed it, slung it over my shoulder, not even bothering to grab more supplies before I raced down the stairs and through the snow. Nothing was waiting for me out there except for the flutter of wings, Bartholomew the bird, sitting at the tree line and watching me with those hazel human eyes. He gave a shrill chirp, like an alarm that made my heart hurt, like a warning. I had no reason to believe that Lynn was at the pit, but I felt it somewhere deep in the core of my body. She had to be there. I followed the light, running as fast as my feet would take me, heart like a jackhammer trying to carve its way through my chest. Shadows flanked me on both sides, rumbling sounds in the distance moving the earth beneath my feet. 
I was terrified. Of course I was terrified. But I remember the last time I had felt Lynn. That night that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I let her suffer once. The forest took a piece of her as its own, and I wasn't going to let it happen a second time. I heard her voice before I saw it. She was screaming, not in terror or in panic. She was screaming in anger. I heard the shatter of glass, the yells of a struggle, the colorful language of a woman utterly unhinged and furious. The purple glow was brighter than ever. I entered the clearing and stopped, frozen in place, watching Evelyn stand at the edge while chucking glass bottles into the pulsating void beneath her feet. She was crying, or more acutely wailing. Her body language was weak and clumsy, as if she struggled to stand while grabbing bottles of alcohol from a bag and tossing them in one by one. Lynn! I called out, rushing towards her just in time to see her fall to her knees at the edge of the pit. Lynn, what are you doing? What the hell is this? She grabbed the bottle of vodka and chucked it as far as she could, stumbling and almost falling in the process. I watched the bottle drop into the hole and disappear, going so far into the earth that it didn't make a sound. This place, it's a fucking nightmare! Oh! She shrieked, grabbing another. She tried to throw it, but her arms were weak. It shattered in her hand, leaving her with bloody fingers. I, c I couldn't take it anymore. I tried and tried, but, but it keeps coming back. All this bullshit. Dad's face. Jenny's body. I just can't, I can't stand it. They won't leave. She took a deep, sharp breath and sobbed loudly. <sighs> why, why won't they go away? She collapsed into miserable wails, her hands going to her face and leaving smears of blood against her cheeks. I suppose I'd never really realized she still saw them, but I understood why. See, I was lucky in a way. I wasn't from Pinehaven. The forest had never taken anyone I knew, anyone I cared about. Evelyn's life was bound to the roots of this place, tangled in the bones of people she loved. She spent every day staring into the graveyard of every person she'd ever known, aware that their souls were suffering and forced to watch. It's like living next door to your family's murderer and playing by their rules. I recognized the flush of her face, the slur in her voice. She wasn't just hysterical. She was drunk. All those bottles. Lenny, where did these- Don't call me that! She screamed at me, weak fists punching at my chest. I'm not your Lenny. I was hers. Jen was here first. But now she's gone, and I'll never get her back. And you know why? Because of this stupid fucking place. She kicked her bag, glass breaking under her foot. It took Jenny. It took my dad. It almost took Finn. And now, it's trying to take you. She punched my chest again and again, letting out all that anger until she had no more energy to spare. Each smack from her fist was weaker than the one before it. Oh, you, you can't go too. Please, you can't. You can't go too, please. I grabbed her wrists, holding them still as she finally leaned her head against me and sobbed into my chest. Hey, 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 hey. Shh. Shh. I shushed her softly, rubbing the center of her back. I... I, I, I wasn't gonna. I'm staying right here. Just just breathe, Evelyn. Breathe. No one's going anywhere. She bonked her head against my shoulder, squeezing me tight just to have something to hold on to. I could imagine her world was spinning. Those memories of abandonment, rejection, all flooding back while her mind was soaked in booze. She just needed that one stationary, reliable thing to keep hold of before she fell. 
like a carousel out of control. N nothing that goes in there ever comes out. That's why it's calling you, Danny. So you fall in and just never come out. <laughs> she said with a sniffle. Her gaze was locked on the pit in front of us. The, the bottles just, just appeared and they kept coming back. Throwing them in was the only way to get rid of them for good. I just... I looked down at her face, wiping her tears and blood away from her cheeks. Then, without a second thought, I let go of her and stood up, grabbing her bag and lifting it with a grunt. Then we'll get rid of all of it, I told her, turning the bag over and emptying every single bottle into the pit all at once. They fell, clattering against the dirt in their own way, down before disappearing into the void of purple light, never to be seen again. I threw the bag to the side, letting it lay limp and empty at long last. Immediately, I could see a weight lifted on Evelyn's shoulders. She sat there in the snow, wiping her nose on her sleeve, one blue eye looking up at the sky with relief. The burden was gone. It wasn't coming back. Come on, Freckleface. I grabbed Evelyn under her arm, trying to pull her up to her feet. We gotta get out of here. She managed to stand pigeon-toed, and holding onto my neck for dear life. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> she slurred quietly, voice muffled in the fabric of my coat. She groaned in discomfort and rested her head against my shoulder. But then I felt her entire body go limp in an instant, her head lolled back, her arms falling to her sides. She was out in a cold, dead faint. Jesus, Lynn. What the hell am I going to do with you? You could just leave her here. The moment I put her down long enough to adjust my hold, I heard something from between the trees. It was that voice again. My voice. It was like a malicious hiss in the wind, whispering through the pines from no direction in particular. So many of your problems would be gone. No one to stress about. No one to make a mess of things. No more stupid mistakes. Or are you afraid you'll be lonely without a pet alcoholic to take care of? I stood and turned, facing my shadow from across the pit. He was standing there, mimicking my movements, following me like a mirror image from side to side as I stepped around the cavern. The way he moved was like an old recording, jittery and fuzzy around the edges. You're not real, I pointed at him, and he pointed back. You're just a trick of my mind, trying to... Trying to help you, the shadow said. He stopped mimicking my movements, standing completely still. I noticed the bristle in his shoulders again, the way he seemed to puff up, as if spines were coming out of his back like a disguise, slowly beginning to slip. There's no trick here. I'm just saying what you're thinking, what you won't admit out loud. Leave your here with me, and I'll let you go. For good. I looked at Evelyn, her unconscious body lying immobile while snowflakes collected in her hair. I looked at the doppelganger, whose white eyes were focused on me with a cold, unblinking stare. I think I'm starting to understand what Finn meant about the forest evolving. He's looking for new tactics, new ways to get what it wants. It wants the tower. It wants to weed us out, one by one, until 104.6 FM is left abandoned like the ghost of an idea that almost worked. Making us betray one another. It was a smart idea. It wasn't going to work, though. What if I say no? I asked, a hand going to the shotgun around my shoulders. I brought it down into position and was already putting my finger on the trigger. What if I tell you, you and every other rotten piece of shit in this forest can go fuck yourselves? Huh? What then? The shadow's neck snapped to one side, head at an impossible angle. It began to circle the pit again, getting closer and closer as its limbs all cracked and morphed in front of my eyes like an elongated skeletal shape. In moments, it no longer resembled me anymore. 
It was an emaciated, hunched beast that barely looked human, inky black skin pulled tight to its bones like a vacuum-sealed corpse. It let out an ear-piercing shriek, breaking into a sprint towards me. This time I didn't run. I didn't let it chase me back to the tower in fear. I pointed the shotgun directly at its chest, put my finger on the trigger, and I let a round fly into its body with a cloud of smoke and a foul-smelling dust. The creature staggered. Its wound leaked a viscous black fluid that sizzled like acid when it hit the snow. It shivered and shook its bones, standing up tall with a bristled back and rushing for me a second time. I tried to reload the shotgun, my fingers clumsy and shaky, but it got to me first. It felt ice-cold hands against my shoulders, claws digging through the jacket as the beast knocked me to the ground in a single motion. It was on top of me, grabbing me by the front of my coat and pulling me through the snow. It was dragging me as if I weighed absolutely nothing. The acid leaked from its body, dripping onto my clothes and starting to burn right through to my skin with a terrible, stinging pain. I felt my head reach the edge of the pit. That deafening hum was loud, ringing in my one capable ear. It was going to throw me into the cavern, watch me fall deeper and deeper until I vanished into nothingness. I would be just another ghost lost to the forest, another victim to the procession. My hand reached wildly for the shotgun, struggling to stretch my fingers far enough to touch it. I dug my heels in as hard as I could, feeling my shoulders leave the safety of the snowy ground. The creature's face was twisted into a fearless blob of skin and teeth, smiling wide all the way around its head. Those teeth chattered hungrily, dripping black slime onto my face with a smell that I could only describe as sour, toxic decay. He was going to kill me. He was going to kill Evelyn. I had seconds to act, or neither of us would make it out of here alive, all because of some goddamn stupid shadow. I flailed my legs, kicking the creature just enough to lunge out of the way and grab the shotgun. I didn't have time to load it. I just took a heavy grip and bashed the beast as hard as I could across the side of its head. Black, acidic blood spattered across the snow as its teeth were knocked loose, jaw hanging loose from its dead face. I bashed it again and again with the butt of the shotgun until my hands and arms were covered with hot, burning black liquid that formed steam in the cold air. It gave me just enough time to stand. The beast was staggering to its feet, trying to gain its balance with its head caved in like a grape that had burst open. I rushed towards it one last time and kicked it square in the stomach with a flat bottom of my shoe. The shadow fell back, dropping over the edge of the pit and falling deeper and deeper into the center of the earth itself. It made no sound. No impact, it just disappeared. Nothing that goes in ever comes out. I leaned against a tree, letting out a heavy breath. I wiped my face almost frantically, getting rid of the tarry black substance that was still burning my skin. It'd scar, I was sure. But the monster was gone. It actually destroyed one of them. The shotgun was placed on my back, Evelyn's empty bag around my shoulder. She was still unconscious, her lips turning blue and eyelashes white with frost. I scooped her up under her knees and shoulders and began to carry her back to the radio tower. One quiet step at a time, I, I didn't look back at the pit. Didn't think about the rumble beneath our feet or the voices of the dead that were never far away. For the first time, I didn't let that fear distract me for a second. And the best part of it all? I knew with full certainty I would never see my shadow again. I got Evelyn back to the radio tower, carrying her up the stairs and into the broadcast room. I grabbed a couple of spare blankets from the emergency cupboard, stacked them up like a pillow on the floor, putting her on her back. She was still breathing, still alive, just cold and drunk, sick. Poor thing was going to feel terrible in the morning. I already knew it. The rest of the afternoon was spent tending to the radio, keeping a warm cloth on Lynn's forehead and waiting for her to wake up. I called Finn, letting him know about what happened. He said I did a good thing. Still, running the broadcast felt lonelier than ever now as the lights from the tower grew dimmer every day and people began to leave one home at a time. Now and again, I wondered what would happen when we were the only ones left up here. Maybe it would be better that way. Maybe this place would be best left as a ghost town. 
It took a few hours, but as the sun was going down over Pine Haven and the sky was turning red and purple, Evelyn began to stir. I sat down by her side, putting a hand to her forehead to feel her temperature. She was still freezing, even after hours inside and out of the winter's chill. Her freckled cheeks were flushed, her lips a sickly blue, her pulse dangerously slow. In the corner of her mouth, I could see a black substance staining her teeth and gums. Wonder what was really in those bottles. Hey, I spoke softly. Hey, Lynn, you with me? She grumbled, one eye cracked open and looking around the room before focusing wearily on my face. She looked confused, half between this reality and another. Hey, Danny boy. <laughs> she gave me that old, familiar greeting, her raspy voice softer than it had ever been. How, um, how long was I asleep? Fifty long years, I lied, giving her a shitty smirk. She scowled at me and lazily smacked my arm. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Just a few hours. How do you feel? <laughs> like uh, stale dog shit stuck to the tire of an 18-wheeler. <laughs> she stuck out her black stained tongue, still looking half asleep and hardly able to keep her eyes open. Her words were slurred, hoarse from screaming into the winter air, but I guess she still knew how to turn a phrase. Yeah, well, it's a very specific feeling. Jerk. She grimaced, likely sore and nauseous and dizzy. She was shaking with fever, and I noticed the dark color of her fingernails turning blue, even in the warm room. I tried breathing against her fingers to warm them up, but it didn't seem to be working. Are you mad at me? She murmured, a look of shame and disappointment on her face. I knew what she was referring to. She, she fell off the wagon in the most spectacular fashion I think I could possibly come up with. No, I'm not mad, I told her. You scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Thought you were going to get yourself killed, but... But... I wasn't mad. She went quiet for a long moment, just staring off into space. I could see her single brain cell bouncing around in her head as she remembered those moments in the woods. Those things she said... The feelings she felt? I, I didn't mean it. She finally spoke. Voice quiet and low. Those things I said? It wasn't true. Comparing you and Jenny. It, it's... It's just... Being here where she died every day, I... I miss her so much, you know? I nod solemnly, breathing out a sigh. Yeah, but I know. Evelyn's lips quivered. She hesitated a moment as if looking for the words before her little pinky finger curled around mine. But I think if you were gone, I'd miss you more. So don't go anywhere, okay? Pinky swear. I felt a tightness in my chest. It was a strange mixture of sorrow and almost some kind of relief. It was a cruel relief, wasn't it? Didn't like the idea of dying just to break Evelyn's heart, but just to know that know that there was someone out there who would miss me if I was gone, someone who was afraid of actually losing me. It almost felt good in a sick, twisted sort of way. You can't get rid of me, you know that already, I told Evelyn, forcing a sad smile. I'll always stick around. Pinky swear. It'd be like a stubborn weed or a... A bad stain on your favorite shirt. Evelyn chuckled sleepily. <laughs> I hate doing laundry anyway. She sighed. Her eye half closed and weary. She was growing paler, her skin almost transparent and the blue of her veins peeking through. I'm sorry I punched you, by the way. It wasn't very nice. <laughs> I snorted. It's all right. You're rarely very nice. And besides, your shitty little baby hands didn't hurt me. She actually smiled then, even if it was pitiful, even if she was exhausted and sick. I heard a dry chuckle as she gave me that stupid, crooked grin of hers, smacking me limply on the arm. You're an asshole, she whispered. But there was sweetness behind the way she said it. I think there always was. It's 
Same to you, Lynn. Same to you. This is Daniel Esperanza at 104.6 FM. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I think for the first time ever, I did something worth being proud of. Every day, the crack in the lookout window gets a little bit bigger. The rumble in the ground gets a little more violent. That light off in the forest, rising up into the sky from an endless pit into the earth, gets just a little bit brighter. Things are changing, and all of this is just the start of it. I spent two days in a hospital, then two days in bed. No one knew what was wrong with me or how to make it better but the stomach pump didn't hurt. They didn't show me what came out of my body, but one of the nurses shrieked when she saw it. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and just assume it probably wasn't great. But I was lucky I had the boys watching out for me. Fenn and Daniel took turns running a tight ship at the broadcast tower without me, checking in every day and forcing me to eat even when I didn't want to. (laughs) More than once, they found me doubled over in the bathroom, vomiting up some sort of a dark, foul-smelling fluid with the consistency of wet tar. It was disgusting. Uh, It tasted like I had swallowed a dead bird. And and I think I I would remember doing something like that, yeah? (laughs) Eventually, the vomiting ceased. The fever broke. The shakes were still shaken, but more manageable than before. I spent my time bouncing between my own place and Dan's, breaking into his intimidatingly clean apartment occasionally so that I could watch shitty daytime television. He's still sleepwalking, by the way. I've started taking his uh, apartment key at night and locking him in, but two nights ago, a neighbor saw him trying to jump out the window. So now we're locking that too. I spent most of my days on the couch, bundling up in a heated blanket and two pairs of sweatpants at the same time. Finally, after purging my system of unexplained substances and sleeping more than I had in the last four years combined, I returned to work in the mid-afternoon when the sky was gray and snowy. It was a difficult decision. I still felt wrong, like the sickness had torn me apart from the inside out and my body was still trying to repair the damages, but I knew where I belonged. When I got up the stairs and into the broadcast room, my lungs were aching from the long walk. I didn't count, but I think those extra 17 steps are back. All at once, I was greeted to the usual smell of burnt coffee and the sight of my two coworkers lazily going about their day. Finn was standing at the back of the room, having a cigarette next to the sink. I told him not to smoke in here, but he didn't listen. His bandages were off, the twisted skin beneath still raw and pink, and his face and hair shaved on one side to clean up the uneven mess. Believe it or not, burn scars kind of suited him. Daniel was at the desk, actually doing his job. Sort of. I could see he was already getting his collection of Christmas hats out because on his head was a stupid little band with reindeer antlers on it. God. And great news. He announced into his microphone. Our very own Scrooge, Miss Evelyn McKinnon, has returned to Pine Haven Radio just in time for the holidays. And viewers, let me tell you, she looks like hot, stinky garbage. Daniel gave a stupid gap-tooth grin and started giggling when I kicked the base of his chair. Fucking goblin of a man. You're not live, are you? I groaned, tossing my coat to the side. 
Finn was there in less than 10 seconds to put it on the coat rack where it belonged, giving me a disgruntled side eye. Yep. Dan answered, turning off his microphone with the push of a button. He cracked his knuckles proudly. <laughs> but don't worry, no one's listening. Probably. Dan stuck one lanky leg out and kicked my chair back, away from the desk. Welcome back, my little intestinal cramp. We missed you. I plopped down in my chair, headset around my neck, and a tired scowl on my face. I guess it's kind of good to be back, you rat bastard son of a bitch. Won't be for very long, Finn said from the back of the room, putting out a cigarette in a makeshift ashtray he'd fashioned from an old peanut butter lid. He was stirring a cup of coffee, which he put down in front of me. Winter storms tonight, fog day tomorrow. First one in a while. I groaned loudly, leaning back on my seat and slumping down as if all my bones had been sucked out of my body. You know, I was enjoying the nice weather, I said, gesturing out to the overcast, snowy sky, and the frost that was collecting on the lookout window. The fog days were becoming more common than ever, happening once or twice a week on average. Most of the time, the radio did its job. That constant, quiet signal was enough to keep the various beasts at bay and stop the fog at the tree line. But they were getting smarter. We all knew that. And if there was a way to get the radio tower down, <laughs> oh, they were sure as hell gonna try at every single available opportunity. So, what's the plan? Daniel asked, that cheery look on his face fading away and replaced with that all-familiar stress. Something about the big-eyed, worried expression mixed with the reindeer hat was just so, so depressing. Finn was already lighting up a second cigarette. I think you had the right idea last time, he commented, patting Dan on his shoulder. Get the generator out tonight. Get everything prepared for a winter storm. It takes less than five minutes for the fog to reach the town. That's how long we'll have to get the power back on if it goes out. This time, no distractions. Keep your head screwed on. He was looking at Dan, specifically. He remembered that night just as clearly as the rest of us did. Perhaps even more. Finn lived at the edge of town, in an old farmhouse that was now standing on its last legs thanks to the damage the fog had done. It would take a long time to fix it back up. And even longer to fix this place's rotten reputation. Ugh, I still had nightmares about it. It was no wonder Pinehaven was shrinking down to a microscopic level. Generator. Lockdown. No distractions. Got it. I counted off the steps on my fingers. The snow was already starting to fall a little bit heavier. The wind whistling through the crack in the lookout window. How long's that been there? Finn pointed at the corner of the glass, where the spiderweb-shaped crack had been steadily growing. Eh, a while? I shrugged, sipping my coffee and watching the nearest pines turn white. Keeps getting bigger, too. Every time this place starts to shake and shimmy. Which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> kind of all the time. Yes, I've noticed. Finn snapped impatiently. I could see his gaze fixed on the window on that fragile corner, just waiting to shatter. Cracks in the walls. There was a silent, unsteady moment between the three of us. As the wind whistled through the trees and pushed against the stilts holding us up, the chill in the air was more than just a draft. I should, um... I should, like, put a tarp over my truck tonight, just in case we, you know, need to mosey out. You, you think? Yeah, I think. I was already standing up, putting my headset down and pushing in my chair. Uh, tarp's still out in the shed? Finn nodded, but he never looked my way. And there's one thing you gotta know about this place when it comes to wintertime, and that's this. When it snows, it really fucking snows. This garbage was coming down like it meant it. Like it had a date with the ground that it just needed to keep. When I reached the bottom step, my ratty old boots didn't stand a chance, and all at once, I felt the immense discomfort of moisture against the toes of my socks. Oh, God. Ugh, great. I was going to be thinking about that for the rest of the day. 
I trudged through the freezing white bullshit, leaving a trail of grumpy footprints behind me. Once I got to the shed, I squinted up at one of the security cameras. It was propped there on the side, right in one in the corner. You know, where the guys in the station could certainly see me having a fantastic time. The door was harder to open than usual, sticking in the snow. That issue came secondary, however, as I could see the broken fibers of something organic pulling apart as the door scraped open. At first I thought it was just like a thick spider web stuck in the crack, but then I heard the buzzing. As the dim light of an overcast sky pooled in through the dusty windows, I could see the clustered shapes of giant wasps' nests that were stuck to almost every surface of the shed. The walls, the shelves, (laughs) even the generator itself was covered in the stuff. Sticky, disgusting goo dripped from the ceiling, and larva wriggled and inched across the floor like a living carpet. My skin did not just crawl. It turned itself inside out. (laughs) I fucking hate wasps. Ow, shit! I felt a sharp sting to my hand as one of the little pricks, big and angry, stung at my knuckles while I forced the door open. Another one got the side of my neck, a third got my thumb. Christ, there were tons of them all clustered around the doorknob and furiously circling. I backed up, holding my stinging hand as the spot started to swell. But I didn't come all the way out here, getting my socks wet in the snow for nothing. Tarps weren't very far. I stepped into the shed and reached for one, pulling it out and dragging it across the nasty, infested ground as my boots sank into the soft piles of larva. The hornets were crowding me, buzzing in my face the whole time. But before I left, I saw something in the corner of the shed, hidden in the shadows beneath an old woodworking table. Something large was moving around, skittering across the floor. Ha! Nope, no, nope, no thanks. Absolutely not, to be precise. I trudged my way back, but Finn apparently had other ideas. He was already on his way down the stairs, a green canister in his hands, before I managed to actually reach the parking lot. Saw you on the security cameras, he called down from the middle of the stairs, while I stood at the bottom, my pant legs wet from the snow and my skin itchy. Enjoy the show? I asked dryly, scratching at my hand. Oh, these little assholes got me good. Finn was shaking the can in his hand with a sharp metallic rattle. Well, this will be the end of them. We had a few foggers in the cabinet. Give it a couple hours, they'll all be dead. I gave a grumpy whine as he passed by, off to take care of business while I protected my old truck from the impending storm. That would have been great to know about way earlier, I shouted after him. He laughed, simply yelling back, You would have known if you would have checked, dumbass. The snow was already building up on the truck. I brushed it away with my hands, the icy cold sting feeling oddly soothing against my burning skin. I got the tarp draped over it well enough on my own, but all the while, I couldn't shake the eerie chill I felt. It was like being naked and exposed in a crowd, watched by so many eyes. They were out there, in the woods. They were hidden between the branches, watching from the tops of the trees and the hazy blur of falling snow. I could hear the motion of dead leaves and the flutter of wings. A shrill screech rang out above me, and I saw that ugly little mountain bird land at the borderline between safety and the wild horrors of the forest. He didn't always screech and chirp, but when he did, his voice sounded so strange. Like, the high-pitched yell of a man trapped in a tiny throat. What do you want? I glared at Bartholomew, and he glared back. He shrieked again, like a piercing alarm cutting through the wind. God, it was so loud, so sharp, that I put a hand up to my ear. It was then that I noticed the way my skin was changing colors. 
Those large, violent welts where the wasps had stung were now starting to double in size, colored a horrible putrid black under the skin. I made the mistake of poking one. (laughs) Oh, dear God, it was the worst thing I could have possibly done. The swollen wound burst, a spray of hot black ooze bubbling out of my skin and burning like hot grease. It dripped down between my fingers and into the snow, forming more welts as it went. Disgust is not a strong enough word. I shrieked and shoved my hands down in the snow, gagging as the smell hit my nose. I couldn't tell if that shit was from the wasps or if it was inside of my bloodstream. And one of those options was much more disturbing than the other. I won't describe in any vivid detail how Daniel and I managed to get all of that black ooze out of my skin, but let's just say that we both decided to skip lunch. I was covered in bandages, sealing up all of the open wounds as we tried to have a somewhat normal day. The station was acting up, as it were. At noon, the snow started to go back up into the sky. For about 15 minutes, all of the flakes paused in the air, hovered for a moment, and then began to rise. We watched from the windows, staring at the spectacle as if it were just like watching a magic trick. At one o'clock, another quake hit. The radio tower next to us started to shake and lean a little more than before the blinking light at the top of its peak flickering slightly. We decided to report a wind advisory for the town, letting the remaining villagers know how to prepare their homes for a storm. At two o'clock, we got a call from someone in town. It was a man talking about a strange dog that had been walking back and forth at the tree line just outside of his farmhouse. Got backwards feet and a tongue that reaches the ground. Something about his face don't... Just don't sit right with me, no ma'am. I think it's sick. So if someone out there's missing an ugly-ass dog, it's on Berkeley Street. At 2.30, the man called back with a shaken voice, saying, uh, n- n- Never mind, you don't want this dog. He hung up immediately after. We never figured out what he actually meant. At three o'clock, we all made the mistake of leaving the room at the same time to shoo away a normal-sized buck with abnormal-sized antlers who was trying to attack one of our security cameras. When we got back up to the broadcast tower, the desk and chairs were stuck to the ceiling upside down. It took way too long to delicately move everything back to the floor and put it all back together again without damaging the equipment. And at four o'clock, the sun was already starting to set. It was time to get the generator out and prepare for the winter storm we'd been thinking about all day. The snow was coming down so hard now that it was difficult to see in front of our own faces. We marched out to the shed in a single file line, preparing for a room full of dead insects and empty nests. At first glance, that was exactly what we got. We pulled open the door, kicking aside the remains of a wasp nest that had been partially shredded, no doubt by the hundreds of dead insects now clustered beneath it. Daniel stood at the back of the group. He didn't do bugs. Fair enough, honestly, because, like, these little freaks were (laughs) not exactly ordinary. I picked one up, holding it by the wings and squinting at its curled-up body. It was huge, first of all. It was about the size of my thumb. The worst part of all of it, though? This stupid little sucker had teeth. Dead ass, it had two big black eyes and a crooked set of antenna, but below that was a mouth with tiny razor-sharp teeth on display in a permanent grimace of death. Wow, I hate it, I said, tossing the wasp over my shoulder into the snow. Apparently got a little too close to Daniel, who shrieked and jumped out of the way. Let's get the generator out of here and then burn this place to the ground. I will buy us a new shed. It was easier said than done. The nests had encased the generator over time, curling around it like a big cocoon. I kicked at it a few times, shaking it loose, getting my heels stuck inside of it more than once. 
And the fact that all the wasps were dead didn't actually decrease the primal panic that I felt every time my foot would sink into the mess of plant fiber and various gooey secretions. But, you know, yeah, actually, were, were they were they supposed to be filled with goo? Is that Danny? Get in here. I called out the door. We need help pushing this thing. I heard a shuffle behind us back in the corner of the room. Something was moving around in the darkness digging through the junk and toppling over a couple of the old cardboard boxes. I'm good, actually. Dan finally responded, peeking from around the door. I'll just pull it once you- Shh! Finn hushed him. Now, we were both staring at the corner, waiting for something to show itself. It was quiet. The sounds of movement silenced and nothing visible to the naked eye. I crept forward, just a step or two, squinting in the darkness to try to get a better look. Something hissed, angry and agitated. I gave a snort of laughter. (laughs) It's really probably like a raccoon. It sounds like he's pissed off. Poor widow baby. We all heard it. A loud and sinister buzzing came from the corner followed by the scuttle of many legs against the floor. It was so fast that I barely saw a glimpse of the thing before it flew out of the shadows and straight towards me. A wasp the size of a fat house cat came flying out from the shadows, wrapping all of its terrible, sticky legs around my head and trying to sting my face. I put my arms up, smacking it away as best I could. The sound it made was impossibly bad to the ears, like a buzzing mixed with the shriek of an angry possum. I screamed and flailed my arms, spinning around in a circle, trying desperately to escape it. It was biting me, digging little needle teeth into my arms and hands, scratching at the top of my head and getting its legs stuck in my hair. Finn was quick to spring into action. He grabbed it by its delicate wings and tossed it to the ground, lifting his boot up and stomping down with one sudden step that burst the thing's insides into a flood of disgusting, gooey liquid. It got everywhere. All over my pants, his boots, the floor, the generator. God, uh, I was still clutching at the top of my head, hoping none of its little children were floating around in my hair somewhere. What did I tell you? Daniel called out, still standing outside in the snow like a chicken shit. God, I hope he freezes. All bugs belong in hell. You'll be joining them if you don't get your ass in here and help us move this generator, Fen told him with an intimidating glare before he turned to me. You okay? Uh, Yeah, I nodded, pulling a trace of black goo out of my hair. Gross. I'm just... Oh my god, I'm just hoping that they didn't, like, lay eggs inside my skull. (sighs) The ground was wrapped in a blanket of heavy snow. The layer of ice beneath it was slippery against our feet. We pushed the generator along, trying to get it as close to the broadcast tower as possible, all while racing the night sky. The wind was violent now, burning against our faces as a spinning vortex of snow blinded us from the view ahead. We got the machine underneath the stairs, enough to protect it from the worst of winter's fury. From down below, we could hear the creak of the wooden stilts and the metal steps. The radio tower, reaching high up into the dark and cloudy sky, was shivering like an old and brittle tree. When we got to the top, the draft was worse. It was colder. That crack in the window had grown just a little bit more. I'll, uh, I'll stay the night, keep keep an eye on things. Yeah. I said, slipping off my coat. Daniel was shaking the snow out of his curls like a wet dog. When he straightened back up, he looked out the window into the dusk sky with a frown of distrust. I think we should both stay. Just in case. Let's make it three, Finn added. Oh, so that's how it's gonna be, huh? Three knuckleheads snowed in at a cursed radio station, waiting for the end. If this storm took us all out, seemed like the way we'd all go, right? (sighs) 
At nine o'clock, the snow was so heavy, we couldn't see the forest anymore. At 10, the wind picked up and the power began to flicker. By 11, the generator was running and I was sending out the final broadcast of the night. This is Evelyn from 104.6 FM, Pine Haven Radio. A winter storm warning is in effect. A severe winter storm warning is in effect. Please do not try to travel the mountain path and do not leave your homes. Everything is under control. By midnight, Daniel had fallen asleep. I don't know how he did it. (laughs) The way that this place rocked and swayed in the wind felt like it was like being on a ship at sea. I sat at the window, a blanket on my lap to chase away the chill of the drafty glass, just watching the snow fall. Mind if I sit? I heard Finn's voice from behind me. Before I could answer, he was already plopping down next to me, crossing his legs and joining me on my tireless watch. View sucks, don't it? He pulled down a cigarette and lit it up, taking a puff or two. (sighs) Yeah, it's shitty, I agree. I was tired and sore, my head pounding and my stomach queasy from the wind and the rocking of the tower. Wish I could see what's going on out there. Finn shrugged. "Eh, Probably nothing good, he said. I think you're better off not thinking about it, gingerbread. I snickered, rolling my eye. You're getting as bad as Daniel with the stupid pet names. Don't think I could ever be that bad, he said turning his head to glance at the man behind us, sleeping soundly on the hard floor. Dan was lying there like a starfish on his stomach, face shoved into his makeshift pillow he'd fashioned from a bundled-up empty backpack. You know, while you were sick, he wouldn't stop fussing about you. It was kind of obnoxious. He really loves you, in case you didn't know. And he was real worried. Not so much about the whole black goo coming out of all your orifice, but the, uh, the alcohol part. It wasn't all of my orifices, I corrected him, earning a shitty grin in response. Not the point, Finn said. Point is, he said, you got pretty emotional out there in the woods, talking about what you saw a long time ago, what you still see. Now that we have a moment, I wondered if you wanted to talk about it. I fidgeted uncomfortably on the spot, sticking my cold hands into my sleeves. Finn was kind of like a cool uncle, unusually easy to talk to, but I always felt like I was just about to get in trouble. Uh, I don't know, man, I said with a whine. Eh, I don't think I want to bring it up, but you know, it's just Finn interrupted me with a heavy sigh. Uh, Lynn, listen, I'm not going to make you talk, but can I say something? You're going to say it anyway. Oh, sure I am, he continued. It's been years, right? All this time, you've refused to have a real conversation about what you saw. The thing that started all of this. And now you know as well as I do that it hasn't helped one goddamn bit. So maybe it's time to try a new approach. Get it off your chest so you can stop carrying it everywhere. I sat there and stared at him for the longest time. I absolutely could not stand that look on his face, the the one he wore so often that just said, I'm right and you know it. God. I felt the question hanging in the air, waiting for him to finally ask. Who did you see at the graduation party? Who? He asked. Not what, but who. And that was my first indication of the possibility that he already knew the answer. I got the distinct feeling that this question was not from a place of curiosity, but an attempt to do the impossible. To get me to admit to something that I'd been avoiding for a long, long time. I felt my chest ache, my stomach twisting into knots as I thought about it again. That face. I'll never forget about it for the rest of my life. I still see him in dreams 
I still see him when I close my eyes and think about the autumn tree line. It comes back whenever I smell burning wood or the scent of gasoline. It was my dad. I murmured quietly, staring at the frosted glass in front of us, brows scrunched together in the center. He, um, he died in the woods before I knew something was wrong with it. Close casket, funeral, no answers as to what really happened. Only that they were performing um, a controlled burn and something went very, very wrong. Uh, the casket was, was empty, I, I think. I thought of the hydra again, of the burn pile in the forest with all of those bodies hanging around it. In my memory, I knew they were wearing green uniforms, but my mind wanted to imagine yellow and orange. He was, uh, he was trying to talk to me. He was in pain, and I, I didn't know what to do about it. The look on his face was just so pathetic and so desperate. It, it was like he was begging me for help, and, and there was nothing that I could offer him. I felt my eye stinging, threatening to shed a tear, but it just wouldn't come. I, I think the worst part is that he seemed to recognize me. I, I don't think it would have hurt so much if he wasn't still himself, you know? It, it was like he... It was like he was trying to say goodbye and... All I did was run away. Finn didn't say anything for a long time. He didn't try to comfort me. He didn't move. He just let me say what I needed to say. And I guess I can appreciate that. With a stressed sigh, I reached over, grabbing the cigarette out of his hand and taking a puff from it. It was gross, slightly wet at the end, and it tickled the back of my throat in a way that I didn't like, so I gave it back. And finally, after a long moment of solemn quiet between the two of us, Finn spoke up again. I never told you about my folks, he said. I chuckled, sniffling a bit. <laughs> well, you never really tell a shit, to, to be fair. Even he had to laugh. <laughs> you're not wrong, he said, but your story reminds me of my mom a little bit. She passed away ten years ago. Not from the forest, mind you. She just got sick. Never got to say goodbye to her either. He paused, staring out into the swirling snow, his eyes off in some distant thought. I was at work, too busy to answer the phone. She left me a voicemail telling me that it was almost time for her to go, but I, uh, I didn't answer. I promised I'd never ignore a call for help, but I left her hanging on that line until she just wasn't here anymore. Finn wasn't a crier, and even now he didn't shed a single tear, but that far-off look in his eyes and the tired frown on his face said it all. As strong as he was, I think his heart was exhausted. And I was starting to understand now why he was still here. Why he didn't give up on us. Why he was always fixing other people's mistakes. I don't think he's capable of not helping. Oh, shit, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I tried to offer some sympathy. I wasn't really very good at encouraging or comforting, but he knew that. Nah, I don't say you're sorry, Finn said with a shake of his head. One big hand came down and clapped onto my knee, giving it a pat. Just do me a favor. Call your mom once in a while, okay? You know, I got the feeling my mom didn't want to hear from me. She wasn't really a big fan after what I did. 
how I acted, where I ended up. She didn't offer her home when I lost mine. She didn't visit me in rehab. But looking out the window at the snow, imagining what might happen if this place wasn't even standing here tomorrow? Eh, maybe that was a loose end worth tying up. If we survive the night, I'll think about it, I said. It seemed to be good enough for Finn. He just smiled at me, lapsing back into silence, then turned and looked out the window once again. The wind was moving like a cyclone now, pushing us in all directions slowly one way and then another. I got up onto my feet, stretching my aching back. But before I walked away, I looked down at Fen one more time. Hey, um, thanks, bud. Thanks for, you know, uh, telling me all that. He nodded his head, taking another deep inhale from the end of his cigarette. Give me three more years, I might tell you one more fact about myself. I grinned at him and walked over to one of the storage cabinets, pulling out one of our emergency blankets, the kind paramedics keep on hand. I knelt down next to Daniel and spread it over him, tucking in his arms while he continued to sleep like a fucking rock. Even sprawled down on the floor, he looked peaceful. <laughs> it was kind of sweet. The peace was interrupted by a scream of feedback from one of the abandoned headsets on the desk. I winced as I got up, rushing over to make sure the broadcast was still playing. It was, only the audio on the screen wasn't a song from the lineup anymore. It was something different. A file simply labeled FM1. I knew it was stupid to put the headphones over my ears, but I still did it. And at first, all I heard was white noise and a whistle of wind. Then, a voice began to come through. Gruff, with that familiar Virginian accent. Don't you worry now, my little ginger snap, he said, his voice taking on a malicious rasp. Papa's on his way home. The floor beneath us rumbled. Daniel was shocked awake from his sleep, disoriented as if jolted from a bad dream. Through the swirling confusion of snow that covered our view, all we could see was the faint glow of that purple light coming from deep in the forest, pulsating bright enough to break through the frost. I heard a scratch. It was the crack in the window glass spreading out farther like a web that covered the entirety of the outlook. We all watched with horror and anticipation as the first shards began to fall out onto the floor. Cold air rushing in. This is Evelyn McKinnon at 104.6 FM, and I just realized something. In this blinding blizzard, I'm not sure we'll know when the fog gets here. I'm not sure it isn't here already. From up here, you can see everything. But the miles and miles of green pines were hidden now, obscured behind a raging winter storm that blustered through the night and into the morning. There was no sunrise. The light of dawn was subtle and dim. <laughs> we didn't even know what time it was. All of the clocks, on the wall, on the computers, on Finn's watch, <laughs> well, they were all going backwards. Five o'clock, four o'clock, three o'clock, all the way until midnight, where they all stopped at the exact same time. Finn and Daniel sat at the desk, headsets on and monitoring the computers religiously. I stood by the security cameras, squinting my eye up at the screens to watch the slightest glimpse of activity behind the flurry of violent snowfall. Sometimes... When the wind subsided for only a moment, I could spot movement near the tree line and a shift in the ground. 
Judging by the distant rumble beneath us, the Hydra was nearby and patrolling the tunnels again. I crossed my arms, my breath forming a cold fog in front of my face. The missing shards from the window brought in gusts of wind that turned the radio station into a big walk-in freezer. All of us bundled up in our coats and hats to get through the night without collecting frost. Finn had been on the phone since the crack of dawn. Anyone answer yet? I asked, pacing back and forth. Nope. Finn took off his headset with a disgruntled frown, putting a hand to his forehead. Called the village hall and the police station. The phones just kept ringing. The floor beneath us shook, violent enough for something to crack. I winced, bracing myself against the wall as everything on the desk shifted a couple of inches to the left. <sighs> Felt like we were beginning to tip. <laughs> Why would they ignore us? I threw my hands up and let them slap down at my sides. I, I mean, you'd think we'd be a priority. And, and if something goes wrong up here, then it'll go wrong everywhere else, too. Not sure. Finn shrugged, sitting back in his chair with his foot tapping. Unless no one's there. I turned to the window, staring into the vortex of snow where I knew the town to be. In the distance, somewhere behind this blinding white mess, there was a little village that could very well be... empty. Think, uh, we're the only ones left? I asked out loud to the room, not expecting an answer. If no one's there, why can't we leave too? Daniel asked, tightening the scarf around his neck. He passed an earnest glance between Finn and me, eyebrows raised and slightly hopeful. Because someone might still be out there, holed up and waiting out the storm. Finn stood up, staggering slightly when another gust of heavy wind caused the floor to rock like the deck of a ship. I scoffed. <laughs> and there might be no one. And, because the fog won't stop at Pinehaven, Finn clarified, passing me a scolding glance. We don't know how far it can travel. Next town over, entire state, the country. I chuckled nervously, leaning against the wall. <laughs> yeah, think, uh, think Big Boy can swim? I asked. Unsurprisingly, no one laughed. The pipes in the back of the room started to clang and shiver, making the most ungodly noise. From out of the sink came a bubbling sound, and then a messy spray of black liquid, splattering across the porcelain as steam rose into the cold air. I didn't think anything could be worse than the blood, but uh, this place was just full of surprises. All the while, the radio was going haywire again. Songs playing backward, or sometimes just skipping on the same spot over and over and over again. By now, the chorus to Lonely Teardrops by good old Jackie Wilson would be stuck in my head until I died. Cabinets were slamming on their own, the light above us was swinging violently in a circle, and ghostly voices were whispering from the plumbing again. God, it was like a house of horrors bombarding us just... All kinds of oddities from all sides. <laughs> the stilts began to lean, the legs of the desk screeching as it moved a few inches across the floor. From outside, I could hear the sickening creak of bending metal from the radio mast next to us. Its red flashing light was still blinking through the snow flurries. Behind it, somewhere past the tree line and through the mist, I could see the vague outline of enormous twisted antlers peeking above the pines. Its footsteps sent a vibration through the ground, one mighty hoof at a time. The beast was pacing, like a hunter waiting for its prey to come out of hiding. The lights were flickering again. We all heard something from up above, a clatter against the metal roof. It shook dust from the ceiling, the particles picked up by the wind. It was followed by another, then another, as the storm outside began to spit Balls of hail the size of grapes. God, it was never enough, was it? Fen was still fussing with his console, trying to connect to an emergency line. Finally, after over an hour of trying, he let out a little gasp and held on to the ears of his headset. Daniel and I both rushed to put ours on, listening in as the call connected to some distant number. 
Hello? Finn spoke loud and clear into his microphone. This is operators 28, 29, and 30 from the Pine Haven Emergency Broadcast Station. Location 104.6 is experiencing structural damage. I repeat, location 104... There was a whine of static in our ears, bitter and sharp. Daniel quickly pulled off his headset as if by instinct, while Finn tapped his finger against the microphone. Can you hear me? Through the white noise, a voice broke through. We both heard it, soft and quiet, as if far away from the receiver. It was the sorrowful tone of a woman, weak, but calm. Hi, Stephen, it's Mom. I know you're busy, but I just wanted to call and tell you how much I love you, and in case I haven't told you enough, I, I'm i so proud of, of everything you've... Finn's finger couldn't get to the button fast enough, hanging up the line and disconnecting us from the channel immediately. Without a single word, he pulled his headset away from his ears and put it down calmly, his face stern and emotionless as he left his seat to stand alone by the window. Daniel was about to get up, keen on marching over to the window to check on him. I grabbed him tightly by the arm and held him back, shaking my head. So, no one's coming. He said quietly as he sat back down, eyes wide with a sense of dread that was all too familiar. As the building around us began to quake and shiver once more, we watched several shards of glass fall onto the floor at Finn's feet. The fact of the matter is, there's no one out there coming to help. <laughs> at the end of everything, it'll be just us three in this long stretch of forest, locked in a deadly staring match to see who flinches first. Our odds were looking pretty shitty. Dan was the first to interrupt the miserable silence. I have something to show you, while we still have time. Is it important? Daniel nodded his head with a sad smile. It is. I want you to have your Christmas present a little early, just in case. As I leaned back in my chair impatiently, my shoulders slumped, and I gave a grunt of dissatisfaction. But this really isn't the time for... He was already reaching into his bag. No, I mean it. I really want to make sure that you see it before... Um, you know. He was pulling out something square and flat, bound in leather. I didn't get a chance to wrap it. it. It's not done yet, actually, but it might be the best we can do. He pushed a leather book into my lap. And at first I just stared at it, before my friend gave me an encouraging nod. I cracked open the first page to find a thick photo album, stuffed with all of the Polaroids Daniel had been taking since his last birthday. <laughs> a photo of us at the desk exhausted at five o'clock in the morning, Finn reluctantly posing in his brand new ranger's uniform, a candid shot of me on the fire escape throwing stale cookies at Bartholomew. One of the pages in the middle was blank, but the caption was already written. November. Evelyn moves into her new apartment. I remembered the photo still stuck to my fridge at home. I understood why he gave it to me now. Why he said it was the best we could do. From the dreadful look in Dan's eyes to the unease in the air around us, it was possible, perhaps even likely, that there wouldn't be any more pictures. God, I was I was trying I was trying so hard not to get emotional. You know, all, all those mundane little moments became a new story. Mostly untold, but brighter than the tale around it. A thought drifted briefly into my mind. When the three of us were gone, and Operator 31 was taking over. <sighs> I hoped somebody would find this. I hoped we would be remembered like this. Not as panicked voices over the radio or bodies strung up in the trees. But as three people who found hope. I flipped to the end where the empty pages flew by and a message was left on the back cover in Dan's messy cursive. Freckle face. I can't wait to spend another year being the biggest pain in your ass. Merry Christmas. Love, Danny boy. As I grinned at the last page, 
Daniel lifted his shoulders in a shrug and fidgeted nervously with his hands. Sorry, uh, it's not super fancy or anything. I'm not really an artist. Or... <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> I laughed, wiping my eye. It's, uh, it's perfect. Thank you. I put the book down and pulled him in for a tight hug around the shoulders. As I squeezed the life out of him, I knew I was thanking him for more than just a photo album. The whistle of wind was louder now, breaking through cracks. The security camera closest to the tree line was beginning to flicker and lose its connection. And all three of us knew why. The ground was shifting, making an awful amount of noise as the nearest pines bent and groaned against the push of something enormous, tangled in the roots. We're losing camera three, Finn said, balling up a fist in frustration when it finally went to static for good. Judging from the crash we heard, the shed had collapsed yet again, unable to stay standing when the frozen soil crumbled in. God, and I just fixed the damn thing too. The hail was still falling, tapping against the roof so loudly that I couldn't even hear myself think. Buddy, I I'm not worried about the shed. I was already getting up to my feet, but I stumbled immediately and fell on my ass when the whole place started to tip again. The power flickered, the lights dimmed, and above us, there was a terrible crack that made my spine tingle. Suddenly, the cold air was coming from above. A ball of hail the size of my fist had broken through the roof, falling through the supports and hitting the floor with a loud thud. All at once, the storm took a turn. Ice was bombarding the windows, shattering them to pieces until the lookout was an open door to the winter air. The wind that blew inside was enough to push us all back, tilting the entire room. Daniel and I rushed to the desk, using every available body part we had to keep the equipment from falling onto the hard floor and busting to pieces. It was a losing battle. Computer screens flickered, keyboards went flying, and plugs were popping loose. Coffee cups shattered, their contents cold and untouched. The whole place was crumbling to pieces. The sky was falling. Ice shards big enough to bust through the roof were raining down tearing into the desk and the floors and nearly killing us in the process. All it took was one, one single chunk of solid ice to bust the console and take everything down. And unfortunately for us, that's exactly what happened. Sparks were flying. Shards of ice tore into the computer monitors, turning the screens dark the floor beneath us was starting to crack straight down the middle, the desk and all of its broken contents sinking into the center. Below, we could see the long and perilous drop, broken support beams splintered all the way down. Okay, fuck this. It's time to go. I was shaking like a leaf as Daniel grabbed my arms, helping me jump from one side of the floor to the other. Finn was already raiding the cabinets, pulling out everything the three of us could carry. His pistol, a fireman's axe, first aid kit. He shoved the axe into his belt and then threw the shotgun and ammunition my way. I caught it in trembling hands, strapping it around my back and filling my coat pockets as we raced for the door. The tower was already leaning in two directions, split in half and letting gravity take it. The forest was on our doorstep in mere moments. Thorny vines were crawling up the sides of the wrecked building like tentacles, slithering at furious speeds and bending the metal stairs. It was a hazardous and slippery path to the bottom, but nowhere near as terrible as the destination. Through the blinding fog and the flurry of snow, we could see the glow of his eyes. Dozens of them, as bright and white as a beacon, the amalgamite roared, the blended voice of elk and bear and human, creating a deafening sound that I could feel in my bones. He stood taller than the young trees, charging forward to crash his twisted antlers into the radio mast. He brought it down with one motion, 
the blinking light atop it going out forever, and the metal bending and whining against the beast's weight. He trampled it with at least twenty different mismatched legs. <laughs> we were fucked. <laughs> it was all over. Our only hope was to, to get in the truck and drive, delaying the inevitable, but... <laughs> shit, man. And for the first time ever, I didn't want to die. I looked out into that foggy forest, barely visible through the storm, and I hated every thought of joining it. Finn took the lead, using a pistol to clear the way for us as we raced down the quickly collapsing stairs. Wicked-looking beasts, fused between human and animal, crawled up the sides of the fire escape in droves to try to take us down with them. The ground beneath us was rumbling, but it wasn't the quakes. Mounds of frozen dirt shifted and bubbled under the surface. Something huge pushing its way through the mines that stretched beneath us. The Hydra had been waiting. I was gripping Dan's arm, but he suddenly stopped. The vines had wrapped around one of his legs, gripping it in such a tight hold that I could hear his joints pop. Fuck! Hold still! I shouted, fumbling with the shotgun. Was it loaded? I didn't even know if it was loaded! Daniel was tugging at his leg, wincing in pain. I could see blood staining his pants as thorns began to dig in deeper. Danny, j just give me a second! Hold! Hold still! He gave me a look of pure, direct determination. But there was terror in his eyes, too. And before I could do anything to help, he grabbed me and pushed me over the railing throwing me off the side of the fire escape with one decisive motion. As I fell, making that sudden trip to the frozen ground, I could hear him shout the words, I'm sorry, over the noise. A scream caught in my throat just before I hit the ground. The snow softened my blow, creating an Evelyn-shaped hole where I landed. And just in time. The amalgamite had finished taking down the metal tower and moved to the next, charging into our once secure refuge. Its limbs tangled in the wooden beams, crunching them beneath its weight like a pile of twigs. Electric cords snapped, sending sparks flying through the air as the tower finally collapsed with a loud and eerie groan, the impact shaking the mountainside. The amalgamite went with it, caved in beneath the wood and metal. Its antlers were tangled in the twisted remains. As the beast roared in frustration, I forced myself to my feet on aching legs that were still shivering from the fear of falling. The ground trembled. The voices of the dead surrounded us, staggering through the fog with their blinding white eyes, glowing like so many fireflies in an open field. Many of them had been crushed by the falling tower. Blood and dark stains splattered across the snow. Others were trying to pull themselves out of the twisted mess left behind. Humans, animals, combinations of the two. Creatures so rotten, I didn't even recognize them anymore. <laughs> the forest had brought everyone out to play. Finn was already on his feet, and I was the first to rush to the wreckage, ignoring the motion beneath the snow and the deafening roars of the amalgamite as I threw aside broken pieces of wood beams and twisted metal. Danny! I yelled for him, but I got no answer. My heart was racing so quickly that it hurt. Dan! You fucking idiot! Where are you? Answer me! I found him! Finn called out waving for me through the mist. I could just barely see his silhouette. I fought my way through the shifting snow, climbing over the remains of our tower to get to my friend. More than once, my shoe caught something soft and organic. I didn't want to stop and check what it was. Finn was already pulling Daniel out of the wreckage. God, 
Even with the heavy fog in our faces, I could still see the blood. So much of it. His right pant leg had been torn through, shards of bone sticking out and steam rising from the warmth of his wound into the cold air. He was breathing heavily, the color drained from his face and his whole body shivering from pain and shock. Hey, it's, it's okay, buddy. It's okay. I helped lift his head out of the debris, wiping blood from his cheek. It's okay. We, we're, we're getting out of here, okay? Finn, can you... He didn't even wait for the question before he was lifting Daniel up. Our injured friend crying out in pain as his broken leg twisted to the side, unsupported. We didn't have time to be gentle about it or, or to treat his wounds. Len, get the truck. I'll put him in the back. I stumbled back up to my feet, hearing the whine of metal behind us as the amalgamite tossed away pieces of the tower, fighting its way out. I felt pain in my ankles. Something was reaching up through the snow, breaking through the frozen dirt and grabbing at my legs with sharp claws. I stomped and kicked with all my might. At this point, I didn't want to know what the fuck was out there. I just... I just started running toward the gravel road with both hands outstretched, hoping, hoping that I felt that cold tarp before anything else. When it was in my grasp, I pulled it away with all of my strength, a flood of snow, hail, and broken twigs covering the ground. As Finn shoved Daniel into the bed of the pickup truck, I rounded to the other side, opening the old rusted door and fumbling with my keys frantically before the engine finally roared to life. It wasn't the only thing that rumbled. The ground began to split in front of the vehicle, the snow and dirt sinking into a fresh hole in the earth where so many decaying gray hands started to claw their way out. We heard the terrible, mutated voices of the Hydra screaming and howling into the air as it started to climb to the surface with its many human heads in the lead. It was bigger now. The bodies at the top of the centipede fresher than the ones before it. More sleeping victims had floated towards their terrible end. Finn, get in the car, I said, refusing to take my eyes off the beast. Get in the car! I practically threw myself fully into the driver's seat, glancing back just long enough to slam my foot on the accelerator. The wheels spun in the snow, moving mere inches. I heard the shrill squawk of crows as several of them began to throw themselves against the windshield, flapping their wings and scratching talons against the glass, some of them with many limbs or two heads shrieking in tandem. The front end of the truck started to tip as the hydra pushed its weight against the ground, towering above us like a tree made of melted flesh. Arms Legs, hooves, tails, and all manner of other mismatched parts were grabbing at the front of the truck, trying to pull us down into the earth with it. I stomped on the accelerator harder, the wheels spinning and putting up smoke. Finn, do me a favor. Grab the wheel. In a show of utter stupidity that was very on brand for me, I took the shotgun off my back and leaned out the driver's side window, aiming at the Hydra's many human torsos. I shot one right under the ribs, the dead skin ripping apart and half of its body hanging loose from the rest. I shot another, hitting its shoulder and blasting the arm right off. The tire squealed and the engine popped a few times before we finally started to move backward, tearing through the snow and slipping in all directions. Finn was frantically trying to steer us while my foot remained on the pedal, shooting off another round at the monster that was now beginning its pursuit. Evelyn, what in God's green earth is wrong with you? Finn pulled me by the coat and brought me back into the car. When I took control of the steering wheel, I did my best to avoid the trees, waving down the gravel path now covered in ice. I could hardly see the road in front of me. I hope Dan's holding on tight, I said, my knuckles white against the steering wheel. I screamed as we spun out of control at the edge of the road, hitting a group of bushes. Finn looked more scared of my driving than anything else. Meanwhile, the many thundering steps of the Hydra closed in behind us as the awkward creature moved through the snow, 
with any limb that could support its massive weight. <laughs> if Dan was still alive, I did not envy his view. We sped down the mountain road at the mercy of the ice and the blinding fog. I didn't know where we were going or if we'd even make it there alive. We just couldn't stay here. Eventually, I recognized the path we were taking. We were going towards the town. For the first time, I rubbed my two remaining brain cells together. I had an idea. It was just batshit stupid enough to possibly work. <laughs> hey, Finn, I asked, wincing as I watched something dart across the road, clipping the front end of the truck. I don't want to know. You, uh, you know how the, the bell used to be like a, a real thing? Yeah. Um, does, does it still exist? He went quiet for a moment, eyes wide and staring at the road in front of us. Shadows were lurking at the sides of the pavement. The ground was splitting open. Trees were falling and creating boundaries in our path that I wildly swerved to avoid. Everything was trying to stop us from leaving. They, uh, they put it on top of the church, Finn said decisively, a sudden expression of victory on his face. Oh, shit! This could actually fucking work! He slammed a hand against the dashboard a few times in a rare show of excitement. If, if we get to the top, you and I can ring it. I it'll at least save us some time. And Dan? I looked at him for a split second then faced the road again just as I had to swerve to avoid what looked like a headless deer running out in front of us. Finn didn't answer me. He just shook his head, his mouth closed tight. This job takes all three of us, I said sternly. You told me that, remember? Y y you, you said it takes all F Evelyn. We can't. He gave me that look again, direct, demanding, and tragically correct. We don't have time. <sighs> Fuck, I hated when he was right. Instead of admitting it, I pushed my foot down harder on the gas, driving us forward as fast as I could. I didn't want to look behind us and see what followed, but I knew the amalgamite wouldn't be far behind. And the Hydra could already be waiting for us for all we knew, the way the mine stretched in every direction beneath Pine Haven and beyond. The village limits were in our sights. I could see the downed power lines, the cracked brick, the busted vehicles left abandoned and broken. At first, it looked like a ghost town. Not a soul for miles except the frightened few who were hiding in their cold, dark cellars. But as I drove down those empty streets... I saw them, people floating in the air, upside down, all of them hovering through the fog and towards the forest, towards the light. <sighs> oh God, it was calling them too. I fucking hate this place, I said through gritted teeth as I turned the corner, the wheels sliding through the snow and slush. We were close now. I saw the distant shadow of our apartment building, now infested with dark figures that climbed up its sides like spiders. I saw the grocery store, its windows all shattered, and beastly screams coming from within. Some of them were chasing us. People who had been infected with black sludge and beast-like limbs. I watched in the rearview mirror as Finn leaned out of his window and started to shoot his pistol indiscriminately, hitting a few of them and sending their body parts flying. Slamming on the brakes, I jolted to a halt outside of the church, the truck sliding in a half circle before the front bumper smacked into a telephone pole. <laughs> I didn't give a shit. I left the vehicle running, throwing open my door, and jumping out with both feet sliding on the ice. As Finn threw himself out of the passenger seat, I rounded to the back of the truck, climbing up onto the truck bed and taking the shotgun off my back. Daniel was still back there. Thankfully looking slightly nauseous and paler than ever, but still breathing. I gave him a little tap to the face, trying to keep him awake as his eyes fluttered. Danny? Danny, look at me. I got face to face with him, emptying the ammunition from my pockets. 
I was shaking from head to toe, dropping everything I touched. He here, take the gun. You, you need it more than me, okay? Hold it tight and, and shoot at anything that comes for you, okay? Okay, Danny, you can do that for me, right? He looked at me with that sickly, bloodied face, nodding his head sleepily. I could tell the blood loss was going to do a number on him. He was holding one of his sides, and for the first time, I noticed a piece of rusted metal pipe that was sticking out from under his ribcage, blood pouring from between his fingers. Shakily, he grabbed the shotgun and held it in one hand. yippee ki He murmured with a delirious giggle. If those are your last words, I'm going to bring you back and kill you myself. <laughs> I told him, my jaw quivering. The tears on my face felt like they were turning to frost in the cold wind. Daniel grinned and stuck on his hand, extending his little pinky finger. Won't be. He croaked. Pinky swear. I wrapped our fingers together, squeezing them tight. As the ground shook from the amalgamite's approaching steps, a sob left my throat, and I wiped my face with my sleeve. The road was cracking. The tunnels beneath the town were collapsing from the weight of the hydra as it tried to punch its way through the concrete. It was right below us. I love you, Danny boy, I said. He gave me a stupid toothy grin, blood collecting in the corners of his mouth. Love you too, freckle face. He ruffled the top of my head with a filthy hand. Now, go do your job. I'll see you soon. Promise. I could hear the roar of the amalgamite growing closer. I couldn't tell if it was following us, or if it was simply leaving destruction in its path without design. But its hooves made the earth tremble beneath our feet. I quickly jumped off the truck and rushed after Finn, following him up to the church steps, where the doors were already busted open. Creatures from the forest were waiting for us. A twisted collection of human limbs was crawling across the walls like an insect, leaving burning black sludge in its wake as its tongue lolled out of its mouth. It looked our way and let out a shriek which was quickly silenced by Finn's pistol before he moved on to the next. The thing still moved, writhing on the floor and attempting to drag itself with all of its spiny limbs. I made a split-second decision and pulled the fireman's axe out of Finn's belt, lifting it over my head and bringing it down on the sack of flesh with righteous fury. It felt fucking good, too. <laughs> I heard a blast from the shotgun outside, and my stomach flipped. The Hydra was screaming, pulling itself out of the ground. While Finn was busying himself crushing some giant, screeching insect under his boot, I rushed to the back of the church and threw open every door I could find until I saw the old rickety ladder that rose up the ancient brass bell. Finn, it's here! I shouted over my shoulder, already beginning my climb. My hands were slippery covered in Daniel's blood and dark gooey substances I didn't even want an explanation for. My shoes were soaked from the snow, making it hard not to slip and fall back down to the bottom. I heard Finn's pistol again, popping one after another, followed by the wet sound of something bursting. He wasn't following me. Windows shattered, beastly voices screeched, the walls of the building rattled. The church began to shake as something huge pounded on the walls, smashing into the old paint-chipped wood. From the corner of my eye, I saw the glimpse of rotten hands reaching through the cracks. All I could do was climb and hope to God those other two idiots could handle themselves. Something cold grabbed my leg. It was tugging me down, digging claws into my skin. I looked down for the briefest moment, spotting the gnarled face of a beast made of twigs and human flesh. It had followed me up and was wrapping thorny fingers around my ankle. I shrieked and kicked at it, 
again and again until I heard its neck crack and its head twist to the side. That root-covered face reminded me of an old friend I wished I could have kicked to death. I had my chance. I raced to the top of the tower as quickly as I could and pulled myself up into the cold air. The wind was howling. The earth was shaking. The source of those enormous steps was standing right before me. The amalgamites' many eyes all blinking at once through the fog. I saw the silhouette of its giant form, antlers made of twisting flesh and bone, now covered in debris from the destruction it had brought to our sleepy mountain town. The enormous beast tilted its head back, a mouthful of mismatched teeth opening down the length of its neck. It made a horrendous sound, like the bellow of an old foghorn, the smell of death and wet leaves carried on its breath. My hand reached for the rope above me as the amalgamite leaned closer, its jaws dripping with black sludge. I pulled with all of my weight, and the bell let out a tremendous sound that made my ears sting and my teeth chatter. The wind changed directions. The fog seemed to part around me as if pushed back by a powerful force. I rang the bell again and again, even when my arms began to burn and my hands were growing chapped and red. The amalgamite stumbled back slightly with each sound that reached its ears, reluctant to leave but pushed away by an invisible force field that grew stronger with each shrill sound. That's right! I screamed, laughing through the panic and the fear. <laughs> Go on! Get! This is my house! You hear me? You fucking hear me, you big bitch! I pulled the rope in quick succession, fueled by adrenaline and pure, feral joy. I didn't stop until I was too exhausted to continue, finally collapsing to my knees. The world went eerily quiet. After a while, the ground no longer rumbled. The amalgamite steps faded into the distance. And for the first time in hours, I could see more than an inch in front of my face again. The fog was creeping back into the forest bit by bit, the many denizens of its accursed grounds going with it. I didn't recognize Pinehaven anymore. It was in ruins now torn to pieces with old, familiar buildings turned to rubble. My old elementary school was just a pile of bricks. The convenience store didn't have a roof, and out in the streets, some very confused and sore people were finding themselves waking up from dreams of floating towards a bright, magenta light. Some were screaming or crying, and others were just in shock. <laughs> they might not even remember what happened here today. I sat up there alone, catching my breath and looking over the entire town. I could see everything from up here. Hey, Quasimodo! Finn's voice yelled up from the front steps of the church. I looked down at him. He was covered in blood that probably wasn't his own. He grinned up at me, sporting the biggest smile I'd ever seen him wear, and gave me two thumbs up. I slid back down the ladder and rushed out the door into the war-torn streets of our quiet little village. For the first time ever, Finn actually reached for me and pulled me into a giant hug, lifting me about a foot off the ground in the process. <laughs> it worked! I was smiling while tears flooded my face. I squealed excitedly and kicked my legs. It actually, it actually fucking worked! We, we did it! We did it! The truck was dented on all sides. We were covered in blood and guts. Our radio tower was just gone, but the storm had passed. We were safe for another day, maybe another hour. As soon as Finn put me back on solid ground, I ran to the road and caught sight of Daniel sitting in the truck bed, still bleeding, still holding his injured side, but very much alive. He gave me a huge smile teeth stained red. You know. He started, voice dry and weak. He held up the shotgun, 
I'm actually uh, kind of good with this thing. R regular Wild West bandito. Several of the Hydra's heads and torsos were scattered in the road ahead of us, dead and in pieces. Some of those pieces were still wiggling a little bit, but it was nothing the wheels of my old ride couldn't handle. I hopped up into the back of the truck, the knees of my jeans stained red. <laughs> Not bad at all, cowboy. Not bad, I said proudly, giving my stupid friend a cold and bloody kiss to the side of his face. He laughed, dropping the shotgun down to his side and leaning against the back window. With a deep breath, he looked down at his broken leg and the pool of blood slowly growing around him. He coughed, red flecks on his lips. I, I think the hospital sounds pretty good right, right about now. Everything's getting a, a little dark. <laughs> I grimaced a bit. Yeah, buddy, you, uh, you look like shit. Just, just stay awake, okay? Fen was already getting back in the vehicle. I jumped over the side and stopped him before he could close the passenger's door, gesturing with a nod toward the seat beside him. Go ahead and take him into town for me, I said. I'll stay here, just, just get him there quick. You sure? Then was getting out of his seat. Then, from up above, we both heard the distant sound of a helicopter's blades. Someone was coming our way. Yeah, I nodded with a content smile, still looking up at the sky. After all, somebody's gotta ring the bell. Finn let out a heavy breath and patted me proudly on the shoulder. Then I'll leave this place in your capable hands, number 28. It was afternoon. The sky finally cleared for the first time in days, a red sunset on its way. As Finn and Daniel sped off down the mountain path toward the nearest town, reinforcements were flying in fashionably late. Figures that it would take a full-scale monster invasion over the mountainside for them to even remember we were here. <sighs> you know, maybe one day they'll tell me more about this place. About whether or not Station 104.6 is the only one of its kind. About how we got here, where we are today, you know. But for now, our job's pretty simple. Rebuild and resume. The next day, Finn came back alone, filling me in on all the gory details. Apparently Daniel is the luckiest son of a bitch to ever walk on this godforsaken earth because the metal rod that stabbed him was centimeters away from his spleen. I called him on the second day of his hospital stay, at which time he excitedly told me that at one point, his heart actually stopped on the table. <laughs> his family and Finn had been in a panic, but he was more interested in talking about his broken tailbone. I really busted my ass in there, Lynn. He said the second he picked up the phone. Get it? My ass? Yeah, buddy. I get it. On the third day, we were all together again, trudging through the snow toward the remains of our old watchtower. The debris was being moved away and all the parts were laid out for a brand new metal tower to go up. For now, a team of rangers from the other side of the mountain were putting together a little tin shack for us to use as a temporary broadcast station, at least until they could get us back in the air. And on the air. Finn said there were rumors of an election coming soon. Most of the village council, including the police chief, had uh, vanished or actively abandoned their homes. I told him that he should run, to which he made some uncomfortably realistic vomiting sounds as a response. We stood in the snow, Daniel on crutches, and all of us freezing our asses off. In the distance, we could hear the bell ringing. It was always ringing nowadays. It looks like we won't be decorating the tower for Christmas this year, Finn said. Sorry, Dan. Daniel gave a disappointed pout, huffing through his nose like a kid who didn't get his way. Poor fella. He had the tinsel picked out and everything. As I glanced over the wreckage, the corner of something square and smooth caught my eye. Kicking a few pieces of broken wood out of the way, I dug through the snow and splinters until my hands wrapped around the edges of the photo album. Daniel had given me. It was a little roughed up on the outside, but 
All of the pages were kept safe and clean. <laughs> Looks like those empty pages might be filled after all. Hey, uh, we can decorate our little shanty when we get back, I said, tucking the book under my arm. Let's get out of here. I'm sick of looking at this place. As the three of us walked back down the gravel path, I caught sight of familiar wings fluttering on a nearby branch. Bartholomew survived the storm. You know, Daniel said, trying not to get his crutches stuck in the snow. Again. You guys are welcome to my uh, family Christmas, if you, if you want to come. If you don't have other plans, obviously. I gave him a grateful smile, thinking it over for a brief moment before another thought came to mind. Actually, I was thinking of visiting my mom. <laughs> I, I promise you'll get me for Christmas Eve. And New Year's, though. Is that a deal? Daniel seemed more than happy with that plan. I gave one more brief glance to the tree line, spotting a bit of movement behind the winterberry bushes. In the shadows of the pines, I could have sworn I saw the shape of a mountain lion calmly easing back into the forest one slow step at a time. The wind blew cold against the back of my head, tangling into my hair. I haven't been thinking about him as often as I used to. As we got back in the truck, ready to drive through our sparsely populated town, my eye caught the pulsating glow of that magenta light in the center of the forest. A reminder that our problems weren't over yet. They were only getting stronger, but I guess we were too. I'll think about that another day. For now, I think all three of us were due for a little break from this place. This paid vacation wasn't going to take itself. So, where are we going, boys? I asked, clapping my hands together behind the steering wheel as the engine rumbled to a start. Finn was helping Dan get his ass into the back seat, careful of his bandages and cast. I don't know. Finn stared out the window wistfully. Where you always wanted to go? I thought about it for a good, long moment. Given all the freedom in the world, where did I want to go? I suppose anywhere and everywhere, as long as I was with these two. You know what? I started down the winding mountain road, the radio off and the gas tank full. I think we'll know it when we get there. This is Evelyn McKinnon at 104.6 FM. And I don't think our story's over yet. <laughs> After all, the end of the world has to start somewhere.